If we could get your last bits of coffee and everybody come sit down, please. That'd be Maggie McGuire and Ray McDougall, who aren't even hearing me. <laughs> um, uh, welcome to the uh, NHGRI Science Reporters Workshop. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover today, so we're going to try to keep things moving along. Dr. Green will be the MC, but I'll be behind him pushing this as much as I can. Uh, but this is really about uh, getting uh, your questions answered and having conversations. So the presentations will be relatively short, uh, and then we really were looking forward to a spirited discussion. A couple of housekeeping things. In case you didn't see them, the bathrooms are all the way back where the elevators come, escalators come down. So um, if feel f we don't have enough breaks probably built in, so if you need to go step out, please just go right ahead and do so. And we are recording today's event. It will all be going up on the website uh, as expeditiously as we can make it go. And so when you ask questions, please go to a microphone so that we can record your question also. Uh, and I think those are the only logistical issues that I need to bring up. So I would like to get the day started by introducing Eric Green. Uh, Eric is an MD, PhD. He's the director of NHGRI since December. What day is it, Eric? Uh, uh, six, months. six months in a week. Six months in a week. He's having as much fun as he possibly can stand. Uh, so we'll just uh, roll on from here. So Dr. Green. Thank you, Larry. And let me give my own welcome to all of you. And thanks for coming to the Science Reporters Workshop. Um, NHGRI organized this day-long workshop to acknowledge the 10th anniversary of the completion of a draft sequence of the Human Genome by the Human Genome Project. Um, that announcement um, was certainly a historically important milestone, and it was, it was made on a somewhat artificial date of June 26, 2000, but that was the day that my predecessor and now director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, who you'll hear from shortly, stood at the White House uh, with President Bill Clinton and Craig Venter, then president of Solera Genomics. Um, of course, that's a private company that at the time was also sequencing the human genome. President Clinton at that time uh, made some remarkably uh, kind remarks about the Human Genome Project. He was joined, and those remarks were echoed, by British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Um, his role, of course, uh, related to the Sanger Center's involvement in the Human Genome Project. and uh, and. Uh, Prime Minister Blair joined by video conference to that historic event. Kudos were given to both the Public Human Genome Project and also the contributions of Celera Genomics. Um, and with that, the much hype race between the two efforts was declared a draw. Now, shortly after that, Celera Genomics essentially went out of the business of sequencing genomes, and Craig Venter later left the company to pursue other things. But the Human Genome Project continued its work for another three years, doing the tedious and difficult task of fixing the imperfections in the human draft sequence so as to uh, improve its completeness and enhance its accuracy. Those efforts continued until the goals of the project um, were reached, um, as defined by the program participants or the project participants. And so finally, in April of 2003, the very high-quality reference human genome sequence was declared declare complete. And I'm sure, as many of you have heard many times before, it was under budget and ahead of schedule. And I had to say that because uh, Francis is here, and he makes me say that every time I bring up the topic. So that's actually all I want to say about the history of the Human Genome Project, although I'm sure Dr. Collins will have more to say in his remarks. Instead of focusing on the past, this workshop really looks to looks to aim uh, to talk about, discuss, um, and critically think about the future. Uh, first, by focusing on what we've learned about the human genome um, in the first decade of having in hand the draft sequence, but more importantly, where we're going with that new knowledge in the future. The day itself is progressively organized. We start with a basic refresher of what the human genome is and why we wanted to sequence it in the first place. And then we delve into the kinds of basic research that needed to be done in order to understand how the human genome works. Simply having the order of the three billion letters in the human genome is just not enough. We had to develop tools and techniques to interpret its contents, and that really remains a work in progress. As you will hear, there is actually still much debate about what is and is not functionally important among those three billion letters. Fortunately, uh, we have evolution on our side. And one of the things we've done is comparing the sequences of genomes from animals that separated from one another millions of years ago and figuring out what nature thought was important 
because those important bits tend to be preserved by nature. And so you'll hear about how we're using evolution to understand not only genes, but also parts of the genome that regulate complex activities in a living cell. As the day progresses, you'll hear increasing discussion about how basic genomics research is being directed um, at improving human health. For example, you hear about the Human Microbiome Project, an effort that is using cutting-edge genomics technologies to create a catalog of all the microorganisms living in and on our body with the goal of understanding how those microbes contribute to human health and human disease. One of the early mysteries about the first reference human genome sequence was the realization that we're all pretty much the same, except for a very small fraction of the letters in our genome that are different among us. Many studies have already shown that individuals with different risks for different diseases um, are very relevant to study, and just consider family history as an example. The question has always been, why do certain diseases run in families, and how do I identify the genetic basis for those patterns? The answer must be in the sequence variation among individuals. So you'll hear a lot today about a range of efforts to understand what role genetic variation and other factors, such as epigenetics, play in different people's disease risk. To close out the basic, the basic research component of the day, you'll hear about how new and powerful DNA sequencing technologies have arrived on the scene and really are changing the face of genomics, and in fact, they're changing the face of other areas of biomedical research as well. These instruments generate vast quantities of data that are overwhelming con current computer systems and computer scientists alike. We will also hear from someone who directs a modern-day genome sequencing center and how these groups tackle the challenges of deploying these incredibly powerful and new technologies. Our lunchtime speaker is Sharon Terry, the executive director of the Genetic Alliance, an umbrella organization of patient advocacy groups. Sharon plays a key role in helping us remember um, what we do is not just about academic research, but it also matters for those who suffer from more than 6,000 rare genetic diseases that cause suffering to millions worldwide. Her talk, in many ways, will set the stage for an afternoon of discussing applications of genomics for clinical research and, eventually, clinical care. The Human Genome Project was launched to improve human health, and NHGRI plays a critical role in leading the transition from basic genomics research to medical applications, starting with the large population studies needed to define the role of heredity in human diseases. We will also hear from experts about, about large population studies, especially those involving traditionally underserved groups where health disparities are common and issues of race complicate the very way we understand cause and effect. You will also learn about some prototypic clinical genomic studies. For example, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, is a signature project co-led by NHGRI and the National Cancer Institute that is cataloging the many genetic changes associated with different types of cancer. You'll also hear about ClinSeq, a demonstration project in NHGRI's intramural research program that aims to study how to utilize genome sequence data for clinical research studies. And this is starting to open our eyes about what genomic medicine may be all about. In fact, you'll hear from the first individual in the ClinSeq study and in any study at the NIH Clinical Research Center to actually have his whole genome sequenced. He will describe his experience and a surprise finding in his own genome. NIH has a long tradition of finding treatments and cures for diseases, and so in the middle of the afternoon, you will learn from our, the NHGRI clinical director, Dr. Bill Gall, about his achievement in identifying a new drug for treating a rare genetic disease. That drug is now an expedited review at the FDA. The photos showing the consequence of the disease and the results of this new drug treatment are just simply stunning, but I'll let Bill tell you about that. At the end of the day, we will explore what people want to know about their own genetic information and how they use that information to make health decisions. During this last panel, we'll actually have some real news to report. The Annals of Behavioral Medicine has kindly lifted the embargo on, on its upcoming issue so that the results from a public survey can be presented by one of the co-authors. And besides thinking about how genetic information will or should be used, we'll also consider how it should be protected. I will wrap up the workshop with some of my own thoughts about the future of genomics, presenting a brief overview of a strategic planning process that NHGRI has been carrying out for the past couple of years. So it's going to be a full day, but I'm sure that all of you are going to find it interesting and hopefully thought-provoking. 
So now I've been talking about our presenters and what they will be saying to you, but we recognize that this is a workshop filled with reporters, and the reporters usually have lots of questions. So the talks, as Larry mentioned, will be short with a minimum number of slides, leaving us plenty of time for questions and hopefully our answers. Um, I really do hope that today ends up being more of a discussion than a series of lectures. Uh, we have nearly two dozen outstanding genome scientists and leaders at this workshop, and I urge you to take advantage of their availability. Uh, we are here to answer your questions. So thank you for att your attention, and let's get on with the proceedings. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you someone that uh, I expect all of you know, my predecessor and my good friend, Francis Collins. I'll actually not go through Francis's long history of accomplishments. There is, for Francis as well as for all the other speakers, uh, a brief biography in your background books, and also you can find it on, on in Francis's case, on NIH.gov, and for the other speakers, um, some information on genome.gov. Uh, for 15 of the last 16 years, Francis has actually been my boss in one form or another. Uh, the one year when he wasn't that my boss, um, he was, shall we say, uh, between jobs. Um, he recruited me to NHGRI in 1994. He made me director of the intramural program, 2002, and then appointed me director of NHGRI in 2009. During these many years together, I've learned a tremendous amount about how to be a researcher, how to be a leader, and how to be a communicator from Francis. It really is those skills that has made Francis such an effective leader um, as he demonstrated uh, in his leadership of the Human Genome Project. So he will kick off today's event by sharing with you some of his experience and provide a historical perspective about what I believe historians will conclude was the single most important project in the history of biomedical research. Francis. Thanks, Eric, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> Good morning to all of you. I'm really delighted uh, to see the room full of individuals who are involved in telling the story about the genome, and a story that goes on year after year, coming up with new and exciting observations about how our own DNA instruction book plays a role in health and disease. And uh, I think there is a a law of technology uh, once cited that says that a truly transformational technology will always have its immediate consequences overestimated and its long-term consequences underestimated. I think that's turning out to be true uh, for what we are learning from the human genome. And you'll be hearing about that during the course of the entire day. Uh, it's great for me to have a chance to be back with my genome homies uh, now that I've moved on to this um, building called Building One on the NIH campus and have now for the last nine months I had the opportunity of serving as the director of the NIH. But certainly as I look across what's going on in all of the 27 institutes and centers, it's quite clear that genomics is a central topic of innovative excitement, uh, whether you're talking about heart, lung, and blood disease or whether you're talking about cancer or diabetes. All of the institutes are utilizing the tools that have sprung out of the Human Genome Project to try to arrive at new conclusions about what are the causes of disease and how we might do a better job of preventing and diagnosing and treating. So it's appropriate, I think, to spend this day, and appreciate that all of you busy people have come here to do so, uh, to try to see where have we gotten to and where are we going next because uh, I do believe this science uh, is driving a lot of the excitement right now in biomedical research, and that's likely to continue uh, for some time. The program you've uh, had uh, laid out for you just now by Eric and is in the agenda is actually quite broad and will touch on many different areas. Uh, my task this morning, I think, was to sort of reflect a bit upon what's happened over the course of the last few years, uh, perhaps touch on a few of the major milestones uh, and then speculate a tad about where this might all go, and then I hope we can have some interaction. As Eric said, that was a big part of today's intention, is to make this an uh, interactive event. Well, <coughs> that's genetics, in case you were wondering. <laughs> uh, we're pretty smart at NIH. We have figured out how to do genetics. It's just thought like this. You put that together with that, and you get that. Uh, just a little bit of a silly point, but after all, what we are interested in is human genetics. We're interested not just in uh, 
phenotypes that may be reflected in outward appearances, but we're particularly interested in phenotypes as they relate to disease. And everything you're going to hear about today is really driven by that desire. For me as a physician, a medical geneticist, the appeal of the Genome Project was the chance to actually try to come up with answers uh, for the thousands of conditions uh, that we currently know sort of how to diagnose, although oftentimes we're not quite sure, and often uh, don't really quite know what the molecular basis is or what to do about them. So we are trying to go beyond the external uh, to something more fundamental in terms of our understanding of disease and using the genome as the means to do that. And here we are at 10 years as was uh, put forward in this issue of Nature and many press articles coming out right now in terms of the reflections upon what's happened since June of 2000. But it's also appropriate to note it's not only 10 years uh, since that draft genome, it's 20 years uh, this uh, year uh, since the Human Genome Project was started. This timeline, uh, which uh, has a many different features on it, and I guess for a pointer, we're just using the mouse. Okay. Well, it was launched in the U.S. after a very important National Academy of Sciences report uh, really got the momentum going after ha there had been a lot of skepticism, a lot of frank scientific resistance, but ultimately uh, leading to the initiation of this effort this year uh, with the beginning of the Human Genome Project in October of 1990 in the U.S. Uh, this timeline uh, covers a lot of things that happened in the early days, and of course there was no real sequencing of human DNA in a serious way as part of the Genome Project uh, for the first uh, six years or so. Pilot projects for human genome sequencing begin 1996. The first few years of this were to try to build the technology capabilities, knowing that we were nowhere near ready to tackle a three billion base pair genome in 1990, and also uh, to test those out on model organisms uh, such as E. coli and yeast and ultimately roundworms and fruit flies and a whole host of sort of planning efforts, building maps, physical maps, genetic maps. And uh, so it went uh, until an important step I just wanted to touch upon, which was in 1996, just as some pilot projects for human sequencing were beginning, the international community carrying out human DNA sequencing met in Bermuda. Uh, this was uh, an effort to try to come up with some shared ideas about data quality, but a very important issue that ra was raised was data release. And this was the point at which the groups carrying out uh, the sequencing uh, tried to address the question about what's the right thing to do as far as access to this information. Because clearly it was going to take many years uh, to get the entire human genome sequence. Clearly it would not be possible to publish papers every four or five months along the way. Uh, it, would, it would await uh, the at least a draft version of the sequence before that could happen. And yet there were many scientists around the world who were hungry to have access to the information. So what should we do? And that group, uh, as recorded here in a photograph of the whiteboard upon which various versions of the policy were written, uh, that group agreed to basically uh, do something fairly radical here. And I do think it's important to point to this, because in many ways, this is one of the most significant legacies of the Human Genome Project, is this new attitude towards data release. Aim to have all sequence freely available and in the public domain for both research and development in order to maximize its benefit to society. That was the agreement. And basically, the countries involved all agreed to that, although none of them, as far as I know, checked with their ministers of health. It was the right thing to do. Uh, certainly for myself, uh, being very much part of that meeting, I was delighted uh, to see the way in which the scientific leaders came together around this, recognizing that in so doing, uh, they were diminishing their own abilities to have first crack at trying to apply the data they were producing to interesting medical problems. They were basically saying, it's up to the whole world to do this, and we are data producers, but we shouldn't get any sort of special treatment as far as the use. That has played out now over the course of many years to the point where this has become the epic of genomics research. If you're producing fundamental data that is essentially for the community, what we call a community resource project, then the expectation is immediate data release. And that has been lived up to and has extended well beyond DNA sequence information to other types of information as well. 
and I think has been a profoundly positive development in terms of the progress that has been possible in science since that time. Well, going on beyond 96, um, then sequencing really got underway uh, in a significant way. The international community rallied around this. Uh, ultimately, 20 centers in six countries uh, worked together uh, to try to generate initially a draft and ultimately a complete sequence of the human genome, putting all the data in the public domain every 24 hours. Uh, that was quite an interesting experience uh, for me as the field marshal or project manager or whatever you want to call it, uh, responsible for trying to make sure the project stayed on track. Of course, I had some authority over the centers that were being supported by the National Institutes of Health, but no financial authority over what was going on in the other countries. So it really required everybody uh, to have a general sense of agreement uh, on the principles and the willingness to implement them to make this work. And there were all kinds of interesting dynamics that went on there, uh, but I think it's to the credit of an amazing group of leaders uh, that this was done, and done beautifully and effectively, and that by June of 2000, there was a draft version of the human genome sequence completed, and uh, that means we got to go to the White House and stand <coughs> with the President with this screen over here connected uh, to Tony Blair uh, in England and uh, have press conferences just afterwards in the White House press office and here standing in the front hallway of the White House, uh, Craig and I uh, realizing that the Time Magazine cover had just arrived on that same morning. So that was an exciting day to be sure and then we went to the Hilton and had a big press conference with, as you can see, lots of members of the press uh, attending to hear what was going to be said. Just noticed Al Rabson and Ruth Kirstein sitting right there in the front row. Uh, Ruth Kirstein, uh, former acting director of NIH who just died last fall and who is much remembered right now for all of her contributions uh, to NIH and to our training efforts. Uh, this is Ari Petrinos uh, of the DOA and this uh, lineup here of uh, remarkable leaders, all looking a bit younger than they do now <laughs> at the time uh, that this was announced. Albert Branscombe, uh, Richard Gibbs, Eric Lander, Bob Waterston, Greg Schuler. So, that was a great day, although it was, as Eric says, a bit arbitrary because uh, we had at that point sequenced roughly 90% of the genome. It was uh, a bit of a, a gapped uh, assembly, to say the least. Uh, lots of work still remained to be done. Uh, this was, of course, uh, the moment at which the public effort and the private effort led by Venter at Solero uh, basically uh, announced together the arrival uh, of this draft. And as Eric mentioned, with it now in the public domain, uh, Solera essentially ceased work on the project. Uh, in the public effort, however, we had to go on because it was not sufficient uh, to have a draft of something as important as the human genome. You wanted to have the full, correct, uh, highly accurate version. Uh, by the way, the publications then describing the draft came out in February 2001 and then the finished version in 2003. Uh, accompanied with all sorts of uh, wonderful diagrams. And again, I just want to give credit uh, to those who did this amazing work. Uh, here in a picture in about 19, um, well, probably about 2002, I'm guessing, at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, gathered uh, to assemble uh, the last bits of the completed genome and uh, representing here uh, about 2,500 people who worked together on this project uh, when it was all put together. So I had the pleasure of being a Woodrow Wilson kind of person here, not only using all the brains I had, but I had a lot to borrow uh, from all of this, and that was an amazing experience. But okay, so you've got that first genome. What do you do with it? Obviously, we were just beginning readers when it came to trying to make sense out of this three billion base pair instruction book, and we had a lot to do to try to understand it, and one of the first things we wanted to do was to compare it to other genomes. And with sequencing beginning to get more reasonable, uh, we had the chance to do so. Inside uh, your book there, there is um, a reprint of the paper seven years ago that was published at the time of completing the human genome sequence that laid out an agenda for where we might want to go next. And it's kind of interesting to look back at that because I think actually did a fairly good job of laying out 15 grand challenges uh, that the genomics community might contemplate taking on next, many of which have actually been achieved, 
all of those building on this foundation of the Human Genome Project, but then applying genomics to biology to health and to society. And during the course of today, I'm sure there will be much reflection about what's been going on in these three stories of this hypothetical, metaphorical building. So comparative genomics certainly uh, got uh, a lot of attention and still does, and you'll be hearing more about that today. The mouse genome got sequenced fairly shortly after the human, uh, the rat, the dog, the chimpanzee, uh, the macaque, uh, the honeybee, the sea urchin, the platypus, good heavens, all of these are making the cover of major journals, but that's just a subset of the total genomes that have now had their uh, sequences revealed, and you'll uh, certainly be, I think, uh, impressed uh, later on today to hear how rapidly that list has grown and how ambitious the efforts are now uh, to carry this on uh, to look at a great deal of the plant and animal kingdom. And that has told us a lot by looking into Evolution's lab notebook about which parts of the human genome have been most uh, conserved over the course of time and therefore most likely to have important functions. Certainly the uh, progress in sequencing uh, has enabled that kind of comparative genomics and now enables applications to human genomics uh, in ways that we could hardly have imagined uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this curve, uh, which I would bet somebody else will show later on today as well because <laughs> It's often uh, referred to as, as a bit of documentation about just how dramatically technology has advanced. This shows you what's happened in the red line here with the cost of sequencing a million uh, high quality base pairs. Q20 is a measure of quality. And at, uh, in 1999, uh, that was uh, roughly $20,000 to do a million base pairs. Uh, that has dropped as of last year to a dollar and it continues to drop dramatically. And compare that with Moore's Law for Computers, which we thought was going to be the gold standard for progress in almost any kind of technology. Actually, Moore's Law is not moving as quickly for computers as DNA sequencing is. And there is no end in sight. We're not about to hit some sort of uh, fundamental barrier. No laws of physics have to be violated for this to continue, and it's continuing in a dramatic way. And the cost of sequencing has now fallen, uh, according to Illumina's announcement last week, to $9,500 for one genome. That's interesting, given that uh, the first genome, depending on how you account for it, uh, cost for about $400 million. And the expectation is that we will reach the $1,000 genome, certainly in the next four to five years. That means that uh, there's a lot of data coming out, and that means that the individuals who have to deal with that data find themselves in the position of this individual, that is, the boy drinking from the fire hose, because it's one thing to generate the data, it's another to try to understand what it means. And you'll be hearing quite a bit about the struggles, uh, which are good struggles, but they are struggles, just to say, <laughs> of the computational components of our community to try to make the maximum benefit out of all the data that's now possible to produce, and it will only get more so as we reach the point of having complete genome sequences on tens of thousands of individuals, which is not far away. And of course, the applications to medicine are expanding, and one area that is particularly exciting right now is cancer, because cancer is a disease of the genome. And uh, this comment here, if we wish to learn more about cancer, we must now concentrate on the cellular genome, was one of the first public calls for a human genome project. With Renato Del Becco, Nobel laureate, 1986, in an editorial in Science uh, made the case for the Genome Project on the basis of what it would do for cancer. And that is now coming true. You will hear today about the Cancer Genome Atlas, a, a project which involves many laboratories working together to try to, in a very comprehensive way, find out all the ways that a good cell can go bad, a normal cell can become malignant, and allowing us to move beyond the list of genes that we knew were involved in cancer uh, to the entire genome and find out what's there with the potential uh, and a potential that's now being realized uh, to take a disease uh, and really understand at the most detailed molecular level for the 20 most common cancers what is driving this and how could you use that diagnostically and therapeutically. Uh, we also, of course, are making efforts to try to understand how does the genome function and you will hear a bit today about that from the project called ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, uh, which has been working now for several years and continues uh, to expand its reach uh, to try to identify the parts list of the genome, all the functional elements, which goes well beyond just the coding parts that code for protein, and uh, 
both for uh, the human uh, and for model organisms, there's a mod encode project, is making substantial progress <coughs> in identifying uh, what those components are. And they must be important because you have the same genome inside your liver cell or your brain cell or your muscle cell, and yet it is obviously functioning differently in terms of which genes are on or off. And that's all part of epigenetics, epigenomics, and the ENCODE project and some other projects you'll probably hear about later today are, are focusing on trying to learn what those rules are. How is the genome marked up uh, by various proteins uh, to tell genes whether they should be on or off, and how does that uh, get affected by environmental exposures, and how can it contribute to the presence of disease? Very exciting area indeed. Mice uh, certainly have, for a very long time, been a strong component of our efforts to understand uh, the way in which genetic changes can result uh, in different phenotypes and in disease. And after many years uh, where mouse genomics was pretty much the domain of individual investigators, the time ar arrived where we really felt it was appropriate to begin to do this in a more systematic, organized fashion. Uh, the Knockout Mouse Project uh, has been underway now for three and a half years and is basically devoted to the idea, together with European colleagues, uh, that it would be good to develop in, in stem cells a knockout of every single one of the mouse protein coding genes in order to do this in a systematic, organized, efficient way, uh, using the most cutting edge technology to do those knockouts by homologous recombination and then making those embryonic stem cells available to investigators who are interested in using them for all kinds of purposes. And very recently, uh, NIH has now made a commitment to go beyond just the creation of those embryonic stem cells, but to actually begin systematically to, to, to determine the phenotypes of each one of these mice, again with our European colleagues as collaborators. So the mouse will continue to be a real a driving force in our efforts to connect genotypes and phenotypes. Another project which you probably haven't heard much about, but which I think has been actually quite beneficial to the research community, is something called the MGC, the Mammalian Gene Collection. Here is the problem. If you are studying a particular gene and you want to understand its function, you're most interested, oftentimes, in having an actual copy of that gene that includes the entire coding region, the part that codes for protein. Now, that would be a cDNA. And yet, postdocs oftentimes labor uh, for months uh, trying to obtain that full length uh, cDNA, and it's not a particularly good use of their time. And so, NHGRI, again, with support uh, from many of the other NIH institutes, uh, assembled an effort to do this systematically once and for all, and basically to put together a complete set of the full length uh, cDNAs for human and for mouse. Uh, th those were derived in various ways. Uh, the last set of them were actually derived by synthesis because uh, one can now do that uh, in a way that was not so possible uh, a few years ago and fill in the gaps uh, that were present uh, up until then. So the full-length cDNA project has turned out uh, to provide resources uh, to individuals who are interested in using these resources that just weren't available before. And what about finding the genetic contributions uh, to disease? Um, this diagram, uh, published now eight years ago, it was sort of a good news and bad news story. So plotted here, as of 2002, were the number of human Mendelian conditions, that is dominant, recessive, or X-linked, highly heritable single gene disorders that had had their molecular basis discovered. And you'll notice there wasn't a very much going on until the sort of late 1980s and then it really zoomed upward. And that is a consequence of the Human Genome Project providing maps and technologies to enable you to go and find the cause of those single gene disorders. So we could uh, document that one with a smiley face. That was good and that has continued to go way up uh, since that time. But um, there's another part of this diagram that's not pretty at all. Human complex traits, so that would be diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or hypertension. Uh, these authors, now you've got to read this axis, at this point only believed seven variants had been conclusively shown to play a role in those common disorders. And yet those are the disorders that fill up our hospitals and clinics. So it's clear we weren't getting very far uh, with that part of the effort and something else had to be done. 
Well, what came along at that point uh, was some technology and another organized project, the HapMap project, which was a natural follow-on to the Human Genome Project, focused now on that roughly 0.4% of the genome where individuals differ and trying to understand how that variation is organized into neighborhoods across chromosomes because that could be quite useful in identifying where the common variations are that are associated with common disease that had been previously elusive. This effort, which I also had the privilege of leading, uh, involved now six countries, not quite the same countries, and a host of uh, dedicated scientists who put their shoulders commonly to this wheel, produced all the data in three years, uh, gave it all away, just as we had uh, with the genome sequence, and created the first comprehensive map of genetic variation across all of the human chromosomes. That resource, uh, together with uh, dramatic improvements in genotyping technology that would allow you to take a DNA sample and test it for a million places in the genome where there were known to be common variations, and to do so at a very affordable cost. Again, this is a log scale. You can see the cost coming down rapidly between 2001 and 2005, and has continued to come down a bit since then, although not quite as dramatically. And the results of that uh, will probably also get shown by more than one person because it's such fun uh, to produce these diagrams, but I'll be the first. So in 2005, the first success uh, was reported of taking what we knew about genetic variation from the HapMap and taking those technologies and scanning across the whole genome and trying to find a genetic variation that was a significant contributor to the risk of a common disease. And this was the first time it worked uh, because HapMap was just becoming available. So here are the human chromosomes, 1 through 22, X and Y. And the success here uh, was finding a variant on chromosome 1 uh, in a gene called complement factor H that turned out to be a major predictor of the common late onset disease called age-related macular degeneration. Macular degeneration, the, almost the most common cause of blindness in the elderly, not a disease that I think a lot of people expected was going to have huge genetic contributions because it comes on so late, and yet here it was and pointed to a gene, complement factor H, that was on nobody's candidate gene list, again, emphasizing the power of being able to scan the whole genome and not limit yourself to your best hunches. Well, that was a success that wakened everybody up. Wow, this is going to work. So many groups then began doing this same kind of work, looking basically at thousands of individuals with a particular disease thousands of individuals who were otherwise well-matched but did not have that disease, scanning across the genome, trying to find variations that seemed overrepresented in the affected individuals. That's called a genome-wide association study. In 2006, uh, three more or four more of these appeared. Each one of these uh, colors actually represents a different disease, but I'm not showing you the key because it's going to get much too busy. So let's see how busy it gets. 2007 things really started to pick up, so we'll take it three months at a time. First quarter, second quarter, third quarter. This is the end of 2007. Now dozens of these variants turning up that are associated with Crohn's disease, uh, with a, a, a variety of heart conditions, with diabetes type 1 and type 2. On into 2008, more of these number of bullets appearing. Here we are at the end of 2008. Uh, now we're up to well over 50 of these. 2009, the numbers continued to grow. And here we are as of April 1st of this year. Now hundreds of these uh, that have been validated are clearly true, real associations with common disease. Each one of these pointing towards a gene or a pathway that seems to be involved in contributing to risk. Now, most of these are rather weak in their contributions. If you had one of those uh, variants, uh, its likelihood of increasing your risk of that particular disease uh, would only go up by perhaps 10, 20, 30 percent. And it's still uh, unclear where the rest of the heritability is hiding. In fact, we have now coined a new term here, which is hard to see, the dark matter of the genome. Because for most diseases, like diabetes, or hypertension, the heritability that's been discovered by this genome-wide association effort only represents mm, in the neighborhood of 10 or 15 percent of what must be there. So where is the rest? 
Well, again, the genome-wide association approach really only works if you're looking for a common variant, something that's present in 5 or 10 percent of the population. If it's rarer than that, you don't have enough power to find it. And this is where the ability now to go beyond that association study to sequencing is coming along just at the right moment. And the expectation is that a lot of the dark matter of the genome will be less common variations that actually have larger effects if you happen to have one of those. But it has, of course, not stopped uh, efforts because we do have all of these common variants that are well validated. Uh, companies, such as the three that you see here, uh, have been marketing directly to consumers the opportunity to find out individual risks for disease. Uh, some of us have tried this out to see how these companies would, in fact, uh, handle the request and what kind of data you can get. I have done this. I actually decided not to use my own name because I thought they might uh, maybe give me some sort of different treatment if they knew who had just uh, put in their uh, DNA uh, to the system. So for all three of these companies, I, I sent in my DNA and I made up a little bit of medical history and asked them to tell me uh, what was the finding. And what was interesting about this, and this is a very hot topic right now because there's a big question mark about whether there should be more oversight. Uh, I would say all three of these companies uh, seem to have highly accurate lab methods. Uh, that is, there were no differences in a very long list of DNA tests that they did in terms of who said I had a T and who said I had a C in a particular position. What you would call the analytical validity, that's the term of art here, uh, for the methods used by these companies and in general for DNA is actually quite good. These days, if you're using a decent platform, you shouldn't make very many mistakes uh, about getting the DNA test result correct. The differences were in the interpretation, and you can kind of see why that would be. For my DNA, all three companies agreed that I had an increased risk of diabetes, uh, maybe something like 50% uh, higher than the average person, and that was actually a bit of an eye-opener and caused me to change my health behaviors a bit. But they were all over the place in terms of other predictions, like prostate cancer, where one of them said I was lower than average, one of them said I was average, and the other said I was above average. So what was that about? Well, it was simply a matter of which particular publications uh, had that company depended upon uh, to make their prediction. And with the field changing so rapidly, uh, you could kind of see how they could potentially come up with different answers. Although that's obviously unsettling if you're thinking that these are, in fact, uh, recommendations that people are going to pay attention to. This is a moving target. This is clearly early days. Again, as I said, a lot of the heritability for common diseases hasn't been discovered yet. So whatever you can get out of these analyses is going to need to be revised uh, going forward as we learn more and more about what are the actual major heritable risks for disease. This is just the first uh, view of this. At the same time, uh, you will hear about studies uh, during the course of today that indicate that people who are given the chance to find out this information uh, do, in fact, uh, seem to have interest in it and do, in fact, in at least some instances, have the ability to utilize it positively uh, for modifying their own health behaviors and that they are not confused, for the most part, about the nature of this information. They don't necessarily see it as deterministic, and it's not. It's predisposing. Uh, so um, there will be, no doubt, a rather intense discussion uh, over the course of the coming months about the degree to which this kind of direct-to-consumer marketing needs more oversight than it does. But I think it has, at, at the very least, uh, at least raised uh, public consciousness about the opportunities that are there, and at least for the early adopters, given people a chance to begin to think about how to use this information for their own preventive medical care. And this is what personalized medicine ultimately needs to be about, finding out what your risks are, modifying your behaviors accordingly in order to optimize your chances of staying healthy. A very important uh, thing that happened uh, in terms of making sure that this kind of information won't get used against people was the signing after 12 years of hard work up and down and often much in the way of progress followed by disappointment, but ultimately the signing of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, May 21st, 2008, which protects all of us against use of predictive genetic information that would be discriminatory. It will not allow that uh, in health insurance or in the workplace uh, to do so now has become 
decriminalized, and that is a very good thing in terms of providing safety for people who are interested in having the information. Worthy of note, however, is that GINA doesn't uh, prevent the use of this information in discriminatory ways in some other settings, such as life insurance, long-term care, or disability. So people who are contemplating finding out information about themselves uh, might want to be aware uh, of those consequences that could happen. Another area that I think is growing rapidly uh, and which hasn't received perhaps as much attention as it should is the way in which the studies of the genome have also pointed to variations that play a role in drug metabolism and drug response, and this is pharmacogenomics. Uh, a particularly cogent example is the case of Plavix, which is the second most prescribed drug right now in the U.S., clopidogrel, after statins. This is a drug that prevents clots uh, after a heart attack or a stroke. This is uh, commonly used uh, to prevent a recurrence. But it actually doesn't work for about 30% of the population, which has recently been realized. So what's that about? Well, it turns out that Plavix, or clopidogrel, is not actually the active form of the drug. It has to be converted by an enzyme in the liver in order to become active. Otherwise, it does you no good. And it seems that variations in a particular gene, uh, which codes for an enzyme in the liver called CYP2C19, uh, are common in the population. And if you have a not very active form of CYP2C19, your Plavix dose isn't going to help you because it is not going to get converted to the active form, so you may as well not be taking it. And FDA, after uh, reviewing this data, has gone as far as to add a black box warning on the label uh, telling prescribers that they should be aware of this and, and that ideally individuals who are getting Plavix should have a genotype done to see whether they are going to be in the non-responder category because if so, uh, you might want to choose a different drug. This is a case where the drug isn't harmful if you have that genotype, it just isn't helping you. There are other examples where the drug can actually be harmful. A back of ear, a drug given for HIV. About six or seven percent of people who get a back of ear will have a dramatic and even potentially fatal hypersensitivity reaction. And we now know exactly what that's about, and it's possible to predict that uh, response. And FDA has now recommended that nobody should receive a back of ear without first having the genetic test to see if they're susceptible to that hypersensitivity reaction. Now, one thing that I wanted to mention, because there's been much up and down about all these discoveries about genetic variations that are associated with diabetes and heart disease and all these common diseases, I showed you that diagram building up over the years of now hundreds of these, and yet it is the case that most of them are modest in their individual contributions to risk, and so it seems a bit trendy now to say, well, we didn't really learn anything very useful because the predictability from these tests is pretty modest. Well, that's true at the moment, although, again, I think the predictability is going to get better in the next three or four years. But one thing we should not say is that these discoveries are irrelevant uh, in terms of what they're teaching us about mechanism or what they're teaching us about possible therapeutics. Because if you find a variation in a gene, even if the contribution of that variation is modest, if it's clearly validated as a risk factor for, for disease, that tells you that gene is important uh, to the pathogenesis of that illness. So I would say, basically, a modest odds ratio uh, is probably not really relevant to whether that's a good drug target or not, as long as you're sure the answer is right. Another common misconception is that if you developed a drug against that particular target, it would only r work for the people who have the version of the gene that increases risk. Let me show you an example of why I think this can't be right. My own lab works on type 2 diabetes uh, in collaboration with other labs. We're now studying more than 100,000 patients with diabetes and controls. But the first nine gene discoveries by genome-wide association studies for type 2 diabetes are the nine that you list here, and they happen to be about nine of the strongest ones. Uh, these are genes uh, that we, did, for the most part, did not expect uh, to find in this search. They were surprises. They weren't on the Canada gene list, although there are a couple exceptions. One of the exceptions is KCNJ11. So what's that? Turns out that is the target for the drug class called sulfonylureas. So that metformin, for instance. Uh, this is one of the major uh, drug targets that we already knew about 
for the treatment of diabetes, uh, adult onset diabetes. PPAR gamma pops up on this list. Well, that's the drug target for the other major class of current oral agents for diabetes, thiazolidine dions. Avandia is a uh, thiazolidine dion. So what do you know? You search the whole genome with a genome-wide association study. You get nine hits, and two of them turn out to be the known drug targets for type 2 diabetes. And I can tell you that these drugs that hit those targets don't just work for people with the risk version of those genes. They work for everybody. So there's a lesson here. Probably somewhere on that list are some other drug targets for diabetes that we didn't already know about. And people are now pursuing those. And actually, this list of variants that we know are associated with type 2 diabetes is about to grow in the next month or two uh, up to almost 40. So on that picture I showed you of those hundreds of colored circles decorating the genome of targets of what are now targets uh, for, for drug development, there's a lot of opportunity there because these are targets that are essentially validated in humans. That's where the study was done. So I think this is pretty exciting. But it also means there's more targets now than there are necessarily companies ready to start working on them. A lot of these targets are of uncertain value. Many of them are considered maybe questionably druggable. So there's a lot of work to do to get into the therapeutic side of this. You'll be hearing about this this afternoon. But I think what many people have not realized is that over the course of the last five or six years, NIH has been preparing for this by investing resources into capabilities for academic investigators to empower them to get into the drug development business. Not turning NIH into a drug company, but basically providing resources and technologies so that academic investigators uh, can begin to contribute to the earlier stages of drug development. And that means uh, putting together uh, in something called the Molecular Libraries Initiative the capability for an investigator who's just made a basic science discovery, maybe discovered a possible drug target, to develop an assay that then can be run through a robotic system, which is this one you see here up in Rockville, that will allow you to screen that against hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds. You can think of them basically as molecular shapes to see which of those might actually have activity against that target. And the, the uh, centralized facility will then also provide you with some medicinal chemistry to do some optimization, end up with something that's even better. All this data goes into a public database. And effectively, now hundreds of new compounds have been identified that have promise here in terms of therapeutics and would never have been pursued had it not been for this NIH-supported effort. And hundreds of investigators who never thought of themselves as getting into this kind of science are now quite happily doing so. What we are trying to do now is to try to see how to optimize this pathway from developing uh, information about a target all the way through to an FDA approval in, uh, in collaboration with the private sector, but with NIH playing a more substantial role, particularly in the earlier stages, assay development, high throughput screening, medicinal chemistry optimization, animal testing, toxicology, uh, ultimately asking the FDA for permission to conduct clinical trials and ultimately seeking approval, with all of these components in here uh, to help. And a new component, uh, which was just authorized by the health care reform bill, is something called the Cures Acceleration Network, which if the appropriators uh, decide to also allow dollars to be spent upon this, which we are waiting to find out uh, for FY11, will further uh, accelerate our abilities to put investments into drug development. You'll be hearing, I'm sure, more about that this afternoon from Chris Austin and Bill Galt. So just to wind up here, because I've gone on a bit, as I tend to do, uh, yes, I'm getting the shut it down sign here. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to actually go back, since we are here thinking about the last 10 years, and uh, say, well, what were the predictions that were made in 2000 uh, when the draft sequence was being announced? And because of the uh, way in which you can save your own PowerPoints, I can actually go back and pull up exactly what I said. And uh, obviously this could be embarrassing because prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Who said that? Well, somebody thinks it's Yogi Berra. Somebody else said it was Dan Quayle. <laughs> 
it was actually Niels Bohr, <laughs> the physicist who originally said this. But if you go to the web, you can find citations of no less than 29 people who were claimed to have said this. And now I suppose I will get added to the list. So here's what I said at the time of the draft sequence. What will we know by 2010? You can see the fonts and everything are just looking very dated. Uh, Predictive genetic tests available for a dozen conditions. That's what I was predicting by this year. Well, we're clearly wildly beyond that. Whether they're actually very good or not is another question, but we certainly have predictive genetic tests, as you saw from all these direct consumer companies that have sprung up. Interventions to reduce the risk available for several of these. Well, sure, uh, for cancers, for instance, for diabetes, we do have interventions that we know work. Many primary care providers begin to practice genetic medicine. Well, define many. I think we're still in trouble here because most have not yet embraced this opportunity. Uh, Pre-implantation diagnosis, PGD, widely available, limits being fiercely debated. Well, that certainly happened, uh, this approach that allows a couple to screen embryos to choose the ones that they think are going to be most ideal, originally developed for diseases like Tay-Sachs and now being more and more utilized for milder conditions and certainly lots of limits being debated. Happily, uh, and I was not sure in 2000 this would happen, but this did happen. GINA passed in 2008, so that one was succeeded. And then access remains inequitable, especially in the developing world. Well, we've made progress with healthcare reform this year in this country, but certainly access is gonna continue to be a problem. Just to really put myself on the line, I also made a prediction about 2020. The gene-based designer drugs would come on the market in another 10 years. Again, with all those targets we've discovered, that's a fairly good uh, chance that this will be true. The cancer therapy will be precisely targeted, the molecular fingerprint of the tumor. That one's clearly going to happen before 2020. Uh, the uh, pharmacogenomic approach, standard practice for many drugs, well, we're pretty far along with a few, like Plavix and Abacavir already, and more to come. Mental illness, we have still not really achieved this, certainly in 2010. We know there are heritable factors in there. Relatively few of them have turned up. And uh, homologous recombination technology suggests germline gene therapy can be safe. Well, I don't know. Uh, I would, we'll have to see. Going on another 10 years, now I'm really out on a limb, 2030, and again, this prediction made in 2000, not made today. Comprehensive genomics-based healthcare is the norm, individualized preventive medicine available, environmental factors and their interaction with genotype pinpointed for many diseases, illnesses detected early by molecular surveillance, gene therapy and gene-based drug therapy available for many diseases. Well, I hope that will all be true even before 2030. A full computer model of a human cell will replace many lab experiments. An interesting challenge. Average lifespan reaches 90 years stressing prior socioeconomic norms, only if we solve the obesity problem. Will that come true? Major anti-technology movements active in the US, a rebellion against all of this, and a serious debate underway about humans possibly taking charge of their own evolution. Well, I think we got there a little before 2030. So perhaps uh, our future is of genomic medicine will involve a broader use of DNA sequence Hopefully not in a hard copy. The electronic medical record <laughs> had better come along and rescue these people. But hopefully we'll also have the knowledge uh, and even the wisdom about what we can learn from this so that we won't have the physicians going, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, we'll actually be empowered uh, by the rational realization of what we all hope to have come true, the personalizing uh, of an evidence-based medical system based upon an understanding of the genome. So I'll stop there and let's have some discussion. Thank you very much. the concept of gene modifiers, and at this point, how well do you think we understand their role? Who are you? Uh, I'm sorry, Mark Johnson from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. So gene modifiers are traditionally referred to as what are the areas of the genome that affect uh, the severity of a particular condition, and often are utilized when you're talking about a disease that's caused by a single gene. So for instance, cystic fibrosis 
Uh, clearly, not everybody with cystic fibrosis has the same clinical course. Even people who have exactly the same mutations in the main gene, CFTR, may have very different pulmonary severity. So what's that about? You're looking for modifiers that might turn out to affect that. Sickle cell anemia is a particularly interesting one right now. If you have sickle cell anemia and you happen to have inherited your sickle mutation from ancestors in the Middle East, say in Saudi Arabia, you may have rather mild disease. Whereas if you have sickle cell anemia and you inherited your sickle mutation from some West African source, you'll probably have more severe disease. So same mutation, so what's that about? Well, it turns out there are various modifiers of the sickle mutation, including a very exciting newly discovered one uh, called BCL11A. And what they do is to determine how much fetal hemoglobin you make as an adult. Making fetal hemoglobin as an adult doesn't sound like something you'd want to do, but if you have sickle cell disease or thalassemia, it can be life-saving because it basically compensates uh, for that sickle mutation. And so a modifier that allows you to do that is a good thing. Uh, discovering the modifiers for sickle cell disease has already activated a pretty exciting therapeutic project because while we haven't had much luck coming up with therapies that directly fix the consequence of the sickle mutation, that we could maybe come up with a therapy that would turn fetal hemoglobin back on now that we know about that modifier pathway. So many people are interested in tracking down modifiers because they may actually be better drug targets than the primary mutation itself. Other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Jill Wexler with Pharmaceutical Executive Magazine. Um, you mentioned uh, some innovations and developments at NIH to uh, work more with the private sector in yes. developing therapies. And I'm wondering if you feel that the pharmaceutical industry and the biotechnology industry uh, at this stage in their um, situation um, are investing the resources or have the resources or, or initiating the um, activities needed to partner with the academic and NIH to move this forward? So, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know if everybody could hear. What, what are biotech and pharmaceutical companies doing as far as making the most of this new collaborative opportunity uh, with NIH? <laughs> It's a tough time uh, in biotech uh, and in pharmaceutical companies right now uh, with, uh, in terms of the biotechnology community, limited access to venture capital, which has really been significantly hammered uh, by the economy. And many pharmaceutical companies are actually pulling back on R&D uh, also because of their own uh, financial concerns. So uh, I think everybody recognizes we need a new paradigm. If we're going to have this next generation of new molecular entities that everybody dreams of, we have to come up with a more effective way of having the academic and the private sector investigators work together. And I think that is emerging in a very exciting way. And, I, and my conversations with both biotech and pharma have been very encouraging uh, to the idea of a model where NIH does contribute more of the effort uh, towards de-risking projects that otherwise would have just not seemed attractive on an economic basis. If NIH can actually pursue a new drug target and get it to the point of looking rather promising and even into and through the valley of death uh, to show that you have a compound that could be safe and effective in humans, then uh, initiatives that might not have gotten started uh, can be uh, handed off. And again, NIH's goal here would be to get something to the point of then saying, is there a company out here that's interested? In which case, uh, here you go. Let's license this out and uh, see what can be done as far as therapeutics. The other thing that would help a lot is if it were possible for compounds that have been studied already at great expense in biotech and pharma, but abandoned along the way, uh, because of lack of efficacy for the particular disease uh, where they were developed. If those could be liberated <laughs> and put into these libraries uh, that are being screened now uh, for new drug targets, you can imagine what a bonus it would be uh, if you hit one of those because there's already so much known and so much money has been spent. And obviously uh, that is a topic of great interest and I think there's a lot of interest in companies in that very model as long as they can retain their IP so that if something comes out of this, everybody wins. So I like uh, the, the way in which this is shaping up, but there's a lot of details that have to get worked out. So the IP issues are complex, are, are still being looked at uh, in more detail now uh, by our own patent lawyers and by those in industry. 
I haven't seen a problem yet that looks like it could not be solved. Uh, clearly, IP is important for a compound that you've invested a lot into and that you hope ultimately will become a product, and uh, NIH understands that as well. So if NIH, for instance, is going to pursue a new drug target and take a compound all the way through the valley of death, NIH will, at that point, want to claim IP as well so that if it looks promising, it can be licensed out to a company with the IP attached to it. Uh, otherwise, I think the company won't be very interested. Yes. I'm Meredith Wadman with Nature. Hi, Meredith. Hi. You mentioned the Cures Acceleration Network and uh -huh. that you were waiting to hear what Congress might do with that. I have a two-part question. The first is, what would the network accomplish that isn't already being done by Clinical and Translational Science Awards? And secondly, um, if Congress doesn't provide additional money for the network, would you fund it by taking money from somewhere else in the NIH budget? So what the Cures Acceleration Network will do, and this is all written into the health care reform legislation, I'm sure you've read all 2,700 pages of that bill, so you've uh, no doubt encountered this. Uh, what, what CAN, as it's being called, uh, does, is provide NIH with some unusual and useful flexibilities. So it allows the funding of very large grants uh, that can be uh, academic and private sector partnerships, up to $15 million a year, and with matching capabilities so that if there is a good model there uh, for funds to be matched by the private company or by philanthropy, that can be done, which is not easily done otherwise by NIH. It also authorizes uh, that some fraction of this money can be spent in the same way that DARPA operates, and what's called flexible research authority, which means that we could set up projects with project managers who would have a lot of flexibility in terms of bringing resources to a project when they were needed and killing projects when they need to be killed. And that could be very useful for projects of this sort that need that kind of day-to-day -day aggressive management. And we don't have that capability for this area at the moment. In terms of what we would do if the appropriators don't uh, come forward, we can't do anything because the way the bill is written, and this was, I'm sure, Arlen Specter's intention, unless appropriations uh, are put forward specifically for this project, I, as the NIH director, am not allowed to use those authorities. It has to be uh, appropriated for explicitly. And so we are waiting to see uh, in FY11 uh, what the House and Senate will decide to do. Yes. Hi, I'm Elaine Richmond of Richmond Associates from Baltimore. We write a lot about eye and vision and neurosciences, so this is especially relevant to what we do. Um, thanks for that very clear presentation. I thought your graphics were excellent, too. Real nice, clear simplicity. Um, I noticed that most of your publications are with science and nature. Well, those covers I showed were just because they were genomes that got sequenced that made the cover. I could show you a lot of other covers as well, but go ahead. Okay, so my question was, <laughs> is there a special relationship about getting the uh, information out through widely respected publications and uh, widely subscribed to publications? So that yeah. was one of my questions. The other question is, so this is reaching the scientific community. How about reaching the public community? Yeah. So in terms of scientific publications, we encourage uh, grantees of the NIH and genomics or whatever to aim as high as they can and to get publications into the journals that have the broadest circulation, the greatest pre prestige. Science and Nature happen to be near the top of that list, but other journals are also now publishing lots of papers about genomics because it's hot science. There's no doubt about it. In terms of the public outreach, that is certainly a goal of all of the institutes at NIH. The Genome Institute is, in by convening this today, I think trying uh, to encourage all of you who do reach out to the public uh, to have contacts uh, and information that might be useful even when you're not working against a 5 p.m. deadline, which I know can be a bit of a struggle for everybody. For me as the NIH director, one of the things I most hope to do is to in improve our ability to communicate information to the public. We have lots of outlets for that. I particularly point to the National Library of Medicine, to what they do with Medline Plus, uh, with the way in which public access and PubMed has made the primary literature available, uh, even to people who don't have a subscription. All of that effort is a high priority for us. For me personally, I'm now a communicating editor to Parade Magazine, which 
uh, reaches 72 million people every Sunday. Uh, if you read Parade a week ago, you saw a piece uh, that I wrote with Tony Fauci about HIV AIDS. Uh, you'll see a piece about colon cancer coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, anything we can do to try to get the word out there, uh, we are doing it. Uh, but obviously it's tough right now. I don't have to tell all of you, uh, with all of the pressures, uh, particularly on print media, uh, meaning that more and more uh, uh, newspapers are being squeezed uh, in terms of science reporting. Uh, we are, I think, finding it even harder to try to get stories out there uh, in, in, in a way that allows an expert uh, to write about them. But we're aiming to help in every way we can. And I'm sure Larry and other who are here uh, would be glad to talk to any of you uh, at breaks about ways we could do this job better when it comes to telling the story of genomics. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Hi, Francis. Uh, David Ewing Duncan, uh, author and writing for Fortune magazine today. Um, I had a question about, there still seems to be a fair amount of resistance, especially among physicians and consumers, to using genetic information, especially predictive markers, uh, even at the, the level of medical education. And I talk to psychiatrists all the time, for instance, that have not heard of the AmpliChip. And they're prescribing drugs, which probably their patients, um, you know, there's nothing happening there. What would you have anticipated, since we're talking about 10 years ago, would you have anticipated this type of resistance? First of all, I don't know if you agree there's resistance, but would you have anticipated that? And, and what does the research community, the NIH, do to, to try to continue to um, end that resistance? I'm afraid I would have, and one of the reasons that I helped start the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics, NICHPEG, uh, 10 years ago, along with AMA and the American Nurses Association, was the expectation this is going to be an uphill battle, that most physicians don't have uh, any formal training in genetics or very sketchy training in their medical school experience, that genetics is still sort of seen as that sort of thing that goes on in the tertiary care medical center and is not relevant to daily practice of the average primary doc. Uh, so there's a lot of barriers to overcome. And frankly, physicians are overwhelmed uh, by people telling them, you've got to know this, you've got to know that, you've got to know the other thing. And until they're completely convinced, uh, they're going to not have the time uh, to put into this. So it, what, what it is taking, I think, is for the logistics uh, and the frequency of the interaction uh, to reach the point where it becomes unstoppable. The logistics are a real issue. So for a physician who wants to write a prescription to a patient who's sitting in front of them, the idea that you have to do a DNA test and wait for the result to come back before you decide on the dose or the drug just doesn't work. This is going to get solved uh, when it becomes feasible for many of us to have our genomes sequenced in advance and placed in the medical record. Then it's click the mouse and find out whether that's the right drug or the right dose for that patient. Then pharmacogenomics, instead of having to order an AmpliChip, uh, becomes an informatics exercise. And I suspect, together with the advent of the electronic medical record, which uh, really needs to happen in the next five years, uh, according to the Obama plan, uh, will get us into the place, finally, uh, where that becomes just irresistible to the average practitioner. And that's going to make a huge difference. Um, I think what will also help in the meantime is more and more patients coming in with their 23andMe printouts <laughs> saying, okay, I had my DNA tested and here are the results. Tell me what I should do. And physicians really don't like to be in the position of going, I don't know, uh, more than once or twice a day. And so if that starts to become more the norm, I think that will also drive uh, a determination to get up to speed. And the good news is genetics is not that complicated. <laughs> Uh, with a little motivation, with some good web-based, um, case-based materials, which NichePeg has already developed, waiting there for that teachable moment, I think most physicians can acquire these skills uh, in the space uh, of just a few hours of intentional efforts. It does require a grasp of statistics, but of course, uh, anybody who's giving advice about your cholesterol is using statistics, whether they're calling it that or not. So I'm guardedly optimistic that we'll sort of reach that point uh, where it just becomes, well, of course, uh, and every practitioner finds that they really don't want to go forward without incorporating this, but it isn't quite there yet for most practitioners. Last question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sue Darcy from the Gray Sheet. It sounds like you're totally endorsing these direct-to-consumer genetic tests. I mean, you went ahead and no. took three yourself. 
<laughs> but so I, I've been noticing there's a lot of resistance from federal agencies, and like in the case of New York State agencies, don't want to see these things in drugstores. Um, you know, they stopped one company from doing it a couple of weeks ago. Walgreens and the Pathway Genomics yeah, store. So, yeah, so what is your position on that? And isn't there a downside to letting consumers just spit into a vial, you know, in what might be unsanitary conditions, and then for a lab to take the sample and figure out whether they're going to get cancer or whatever? So you're right to challenge me on this. And if I came across as sounding like I think this is the greatest thing, uh, then let me correct myself. I think it's interesting. I think it's an important development. I think there are certainly people who have gone through this kind of testing and have found it empowering and have given them a chance to modify health behaviors accordingly in a way that maybe they should have done anyway, uh, but actually may pre re result in a better outcome. But it is still uh, a unregulated circumstance uh, that we should all be a bit worried about. And certainly I've been part of panels going back more than 10 years uh, that have looked at this issue and have urged FDA to take a, a more uh, aggressive role in overseeing this kind of genetic testing, which right now, currently, they do not regulate. But of course, the balance is what you're going to try to strive for. Uh, you would like to be able to assure consumers that this kind of information is useful and valid, but you don't want to squash an industry that's just beginning to get going at a time where it could be a critical part of our future in terms of personalized medicine. I know the FDA is working hard to figure out what to do, and I think uh, one of my uh, closer colleagues in the government is Peggy Hamburg, and we have worked uh, over the course of the past many months uh, to think about ways to approach this. Uh, and I think FDA is now going to take some uh, some positions on this that perhaps have not been uh, possible in the past. But I'm not able to tell you right now exactly what they're going to be. So you personally don't see any sort of downside to oh, allowing people to do these uh, I have not heard of an actual example of a harm that has come to somebody as a result of this. There may have been such harms. You can certainly see what harms might be there. Somebody who gets tested by 23andMe and is found to be, by their testing, at low risk for breast cancer might then decide, well, I don't need a mammogram anymore because this test said I'm at low risk. And obviously, the test is not uh, appropriately used that way. It's only sampling a small part of the heritability. Uh, certainly somebody who gets tested by one of these companies and finds out they're at high risk for Alzheimer's disease, they're homozygous for the E4 at APOE, increasing their risk by 15-fold, uh, that could have a pretty significant effect on you, especially if you didn't have a counselor working through the information with you. I don't know to what extent uh, that that has happened, and we just haven't heard about it. So you have to balance those hypothetical harms with uh, what is still also somewhat hypothetical benefits in terms of people getting information that they want and using it in ways that will help them maintain their health. And I can't tell you exactly where the benefit and risks play out at the moment. We don't have enough data. You will hear this afternoon, though, some presentations that I think will be somewhat reassuring in terms of the ability of people in the general public uh, to figure out what this information is and what it isn't. People are actually a lot smarter than I think some of the uh, uh, critics have given credit uh, for this particular industry. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you, Francis. It's a great way to start the day. And um, to attempt to stay on schedule, we are going to uh, just keep moving right along. Um, our first of a series of panels is going to be given uh, by four members of our Division of Extramural Research. I'm just going to introduce each one. They're going to come up and give um, brief five-minute uh, presentations. And I'm going to wait for questions until the whole each of the four individuals have spoken. Then we'll have them up here, and they'll, they'll take questions as a group. So the first uh, speaker in this uh, initial panel is Mark Geyer, who actually is the director of our extramural program. Um, and he will be discussing an overview of the human genome. Well, I can get started while they're putting up the slides. Um, as I anticipated, both of the previous speakers basically said what I was going to plan to say. <laughs> In fact, last night uh, I emailed Francis saying, what Larry asked me sort of sounds like what I expect you're going to do. Can you give me a little better idea of what you're going to say? And he, he wrote back and said, well, 
I'm going to do a romp through the genome for the last 20 years, and I think that's uh, precisely what he did. So I'm going to throw out a little bit of what I was going to say, and I want to um, uh, start off by talking about two of my, <coughs> my hobby horses about gen uh, genomics. Um, one is that uh, I think genomics has always suffered from appearing to be simpler than it is. I think the concept of what genomics is trying to do, figure out the this, this sequence of these strings of A's, T's, and G's, or assembling units into, into the whole, like a jigsaw puzzle, is, is pretty easy for people to understand. Um, the, the central dogma which of, of molecular biology, which, which we're still in the process of interpreting of information flow from DNA through RNA to protein, is by this time, I think, pretty under, simple for people to understand, and it leads to very much to the uh, simplistic um, uh, understanding that genes determine phenotypes and nothing else about it. So, so in general, it's been both a, uh, a, a blessing and somewhat of a difficulty for <clears throat> that, that the, the goals of genomics uh, have been uh, so easy to understand at a, at a high level, but actually um, getting there and, and learning what the specifics are and doing the, the, accomplishing what's been accomplished to date has been incredibly difficult. And the mag, I think the magnitude of the technological achievement has really yet to be adequately described. Um, an enormous amount along the way had to be learned about how to operationalize molecular biology with <clears throat> unprecedented uh, attention to detail, production strategies, data quality, data access, and, uh, and really a new mantra uh, for academic research. The problem that sequencing the human genome uh, set out and the problem that still faces us with understanding the, the, uh, the, the way in which the human genome works is so much bigger than any one laboratory could expect to address and expect to solve made it necessary for um, each group and each person, each investigator's interest for everybody else to be successful. And that, I think, is one of the, the, the basic uh, keys to, um, to why the Genome Project worked, that people really bought into that, that approach to, to science. Um, the second point I want to make is um, thinking about genomics as large-scale biology. <clears throat> um, what, to me, what is um, most characteristic of genomics and what potentially uh, distinguishes it from other um, uh, disciplines within biology is that the goal is comprehensiveness. Now, you've heard <clears throat> the term comprehensiveness used. A couple of times today, it's always, um, it's often, al almost always, uh, used as a synonym for complete, we have the complete sequence of the human genome. Actually, what, <clears throat> what we mean by comprehensiveness at any time in the, uh, in the history of large-scale biology is to determine everything that can be learned using existing technology. So that when we announced in 2003 the finished, quote unquote, finished version of the human genome, we were pretty careful uh, to always try to use the term essentially finished, which meant as good as we can do at the time. And since then, even though the, the finished genome was announced in 2003, since then there has been an active, ongoing effort to improve it. Um, there is a group called the Human Genome Reference Consortium that acts uh, as, as sort of a hub for anybody who is working with the, uh, the, the quote-unquote, the essentially finished uh, human genome sequence and who finds um, what they think is an error or, um, or um, who they, where, where they have uh, may be able to fill a gap that we couldn't fill in 2003, can submit the information and the Human Genome Reference Consortium will evaluate it, will do some testing experiments if necessary, 
and, and, uh, and, and update the, the reference sequence. So even the finished sequence at, at this stage is, uh, is a dynamic um, <coughs> activity. In the, um, in the eight years or seven years since the finished genome was announced, we've uh, uh, closed um, a couple of, uh, a couple of dozen um, formerly unspanned gaps in the genome sequence that there have been more than 150 reported problems in earlier versions that have been resolved and uh, importantly um, alternative loci for some particularly complex regions of the genome like the major histone compatibility locus have been, uh, have been addressed. <clears throat> so all I am going to end up doing today in my five minutes is try and give you a, a snapshot of what the genome, the human genome, looks like today. So it's still three, bil three billion bases thereabout. I never actually got the exact number down to the, uh, to the one in nine, one in three billion parts. But in <coughs> uh, cur the current analysis indicates that there are just under 22,000 annotated genes, annotated meaning genes <coughs> that have been um, understood or, or predicted uh, to the point where um, you want to be able to um, say that this, this is a gene. Of those 22,000, 22, <coughs> almost 19,000 are considered high-quality annotations, meaning that all of the people who are in the business of annotating uh, genes agree that what what this particular gene is from the uh, the first base to the last base, everybody agrees on on the structure of those genes. So those are um, uh, entirely reliable to the best of our understanding. The uh, the additional <coughs> um, 24, 26, what is it, 3,200 um, uh, the difference between those are genes that are predicted, they're thought to be, there may be some good experimental evidence, but they haven't yet reached the, um, the, the, uh, the stage of being uh, undeniable. Uh, those, are, those are the protein coding genes. There are also <coughs> um, 11,122 regions of DNA that by structural criteria almost look like genes. They may be, um, but, but they don't function. And they may be either um, uh, genes, uh, regions of DNA that had formerly, formerly uh, been um, uh, functional genes that have, through mutational processes, become deactivated, or many other uh, explanations. But um, we put them up there because uh, they often <coughs> um, uh, can, can make the counting of actual functional genes uh, quite difficult. Um, in addition to the protein coding genes, uh, one of the um, uh, developments in, important developments in uh, molecular biology over the last decade has been the identification of genes that, um, that make an RNA product that functions, but uh, functions in a way other than encoding proteins, and there are, <coughs> in the current uh, reference version, 3,000, a little over 3,000 of those that are well annotated. There may be several thousand more, um, at least by the time uh, we're finished um, understanding those. So <coughs> those are just some quick uh, snapshots, uh, numbers of what the situation is today. The other um, aspect of the human genome, and, and uh, the genomes actually of, of uh, many, many organisms, is that um, the technologies that we now have available are allowing us to analyze the, uh, and, and, and determine well the structural variation, that is, um, regions of the genome uh, of more than one base and often up to uh, several thousands of bases that differ from the reference genome as a unit. These can be um, regions where 
<coughs> in an, in an ind one individual, there's an insertion of a large number of uh, bases at a, at a particular point, or a deletion of, um, of some, some uh, of a section of the, the genome that uh, is, is, is inheritable. They can be um, translocations where um, sequence has actually moved from one chromosome to another, and so it, the same sequence appears on two different chromosomes in different individuals. There are inversions where a, se a sequence in the genome <coughs> has uh, reversed its orientation. Um, and there are copy number uh, variations where a region of the genome is repeated more than once up to, to many uh, hundreds of times. Um, in the past um, decade, as I said, there's been an increasing recognition that structural variation plays a very significant role in um, determining the genetics, uh, the genetic basis of uh, human phenotypes, including disease. And this is um, an area that <clears throat> we're still in the process of trying to figure out how to represent um, in the um, in, in the uh, the reference genome. So, <clears throat> um, in an attempt to keep to the um, um, the time limit, and because most of what else I was going to say is going to be covered by uh, my colleagues, I'll finish here. I just want to, uh, as a last point, say that. Um, as an illustration of the dynamic situation that we're in right now. Uh, as you've heard many, many times, we can now sequence uh, a human genome for somewhere between probably ten and twenty thousand dollars. But at the same time, it's important to realize that none of those individual sequences yet uh, really match the quality of the existing reference sequence. Uh, even the reference sequence is, uh, is still missing some things, and that one of the goals, as you'll hear about later, is to really get to the point where, for that ten or $20,000 or even um, $1,000, we can produce a, uh, a genome sequence that is of the same high quality as what we know in the reference now. Okay, so uh, this next speaker, also from our Division of Extramural Research, is Adam Felsenfeld, who will talk about discovering what's important, comparative genomics and evolution, the 10K Genomes Project, and so forth. Hi. So Larry gave me a fairly wide uh, remit um, to cover in five minutes or ten minutes. Um, so I'm, I can't cover too many details, but I'll try to, to fit some in as I hope I can give you some perspective on this. And to make matters worse, when I was thinking about this, I decided that I would, should broaden it a bit uh, into the idea of why, why we sequence uh, organisms other, other than ourselves. Is my slide on here? I wasn't going to show any slides, but something that uh, something that Francis said made me think I should. Sorry, every time I, I use a different computer, I, this is just just for background. This is just to give you an idea of the sort of number and distribution of uh, multicellular organisms, animals. Um, that, uh, that have been sequenced. This doesn't obviously include plants. It doesn't include protists. It doesn't include large, large uh, ensembles of very slightly different uh, strains of yeast, for example. But it is to give you an idea. It's a complex slide. I had a simpler version, but I, I couldn't find the simpler version today. Uh, uh, and it's a little out of date, um, but, but I can run it down. So it's, it's easy to understand why NHGRI and NIH uh, should be sequencing the genomes of laboratory models. Um, they add the genome sequences at tremendous value if you want to understand all the biology of that organism. Uh, and for those reasons, we sequenced mouse and rat and fruit fly and nematode and yeast and lots of others, ferret, for example, model for respiratory disease. Um, for basic research, I would venture to say that you, you you, it's indis genome is indispensable these days if you really want to understand an animal. 
But what about other organisms? So what about, why platypus or elephant or elephant shark? And they're all fine animals, um, but what does this have to do with understanding human biology? And the short answer lies in understanding uh, comparative genomics. And what you gain from comparative genomics analysis has made these and many other uh, organisms relevant to understanding human biology in a way I think uh, that, that was only very long term or theoretical or, or un, uh, 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 a little bit intangible before. So it's a really simple idea, uh, comparing two genome sequences, looking for what's changed or what hasn't that you expected to change or not change, uh, and correlating with phenotype. In its widest interpretation, it's everything from comparing the genomes of two different animals to see what's changed and not changed to comparing, for example, the genomes of a tumor and healthy tissue, which uh, Brad Osenberger will talk about uh, later. I'm going to talk about organisms. There's another way to ask the question is how do we know what's important in a genome? So for simple genomes, just a little digression, for simple genomes like bacterial and viral genomes, they're very simple and they're packed, the genes are packed together, the information is packed together. Um, but for, for more complex genomes, the genomes are, are much sparser, the information, the interesting bits are spread out, at least the ones, bits that are interesting at first blush are spread out, and they're also lumpy, meaning by lumpy I mean anything that you can ask of the genome uh, is not distributed evenly. Nothing. The genes aren't distributed evenly. There are places where there are gene deserts. The rates of change aren't distributed evenly throughout a genome, and so on. So how do we know about all this? Well, you hear a little bit more about the experimental side from Elise, but one way we can tell, again, is comparative, comparative analysis. It's still one of the most useful ways to understand these issues, to understand what's functional. It's a pretty simple idea uh, uh, in comparing genomes of multiple species. The principle is, as Eric said before, that evolution has actually done the experiment, it's done all the hard work for us by changing the genomes, changing all the genome at a certain rate, and there's expectations for, for those rates depending on how related the species are. And you can ask two kinds of questions. You can ask what hasn't changed, and is presumably hasn't changed because it's useful, it's functional. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this later. You can also ask what has changed a little bit faster, more much faster than you expected it to. These comparisons are done in the context of sort of the way a lot of people think about them is over how much time you're comparing them. So comparisons of genes across long distances, so hundreds of millions of years to billions of years, so us comparing our genome to the genomes of fish or multicellular organisms to those uh, those that are uh, single celled, and ask about genome features that change, uh, that change, um, typically that change more slowly. So you can look at things like the addition, addition of new genes, or how important protein domains, functional domains, came into existence. You can ask more general questions, like what are the genes that distinguish a multicellular lifestyle from lifestyle of a single cell? Um, for example, you might expect that signal transduction genes, those involved in cell-cell communication, are going to be more present, are going to be uh, more evolved in multicellular life or underscore the multicellular life. Um, what are the genes underlying different evolutionary adaptations from creatures, for example, from creatures without an adaptive immune system to those that have one? And that's the, that's the mammals versus sharks comparison. From organisms with a head to those organisms that don't have a head. What are the genes involved that came into being that are coincident with the de development of a certain kind of nervous system organization? So that was long distances. Across the middle distances, so for example, humans compared to other mammals um, in the range of many tens to probably low hundreds of millions of years divergence, can tell us what's conserved and probably functional. <clears throat> what's changing more slowly against a background of steady, long-term change that is, uh, that is embodied in looking across many mammalian genomes. So it's from this kind of analysis that you begin to get a handle on, on genes, on intron exon boundaries, on regulatory sequences. Nature simply changed everything else. And when you see these in a comparative analysis, you want to follow them up experimentally. They give you essentially hypotheses across the entire genome for what's important. 
In fact, this is really the primary line of evidence that about, when you hear people say that about 5% of the human genome is conserved uh, among mammals and presumably has shared important functions in the conventional sense. There's a caveat here. There's stuff that isn't conserved uh, that's probably functional as well. And there's some, uh, some more detailed elaborations of what's really functional. It's, a, it's an extended discussion. But with sufficient species, you can get quite good resolution and, and quality uh, with the roughly 25 mammals or more that are now done to at least draft quality. You can theoretically get six base pair resolution, six to eight base pair resolution. That's a nice resolution to have for an element that hasn't changed through evolution because it's about the size of a, a bit of, of regulatory sequence. Those are the kinds of things you want to look at when you're trying to understand how genes work. There are elaborations on this. You can look at not just across, when you're looking across genomes, you can look at more than what's just, uh, what's just um, conserved. You can also look at sort of patterns of how things change. So for example, we all know about, about uh, the codons, three base codons. If you see regions that are changing in multiples of three, you're sure or pretty sure that that's a signature of being in a coding region. So that's middle distances. What about shorter distances? So less than 10 million years diverged, million to, to half a million, to million to five million, maybe even less than 10 million. You can ask about very rapidly changing features of the genome. It's hard to ask about what's preserved because simply because there hasn't been enough time, quite a lot is preserved uh, by, ac by accident. And, uh, and uh, but you can't ask about what's changing more rapidly. And those comparisons, for example, us to chimpanzees and recently to Neanderthal, reveals a lot, of, a lot of interesting regions that are either in us but not in our immediate, uh, immediate, immediate cousins, immediate neighbors, relatives, um, and also allows you to ask what's changing very rapidly. And you probably all uh, read that recent Neanderthal paper. It showed about 80 different, uh, different non-synonymous, fixed non-synonymous differences in genes and about another 200 regions that appear to have general rapid evolution and lots of interesting suggestions, speculations on what those functions are, um, including between us and Neanderthal skin development and bone morphology and possibly cognition. These make really tempting uh, targets for speculation and further work about what the basis of the different phenotypic differences is. So Larry's signaling me that uh, I've got to wrap it up. So we use, uh, we use comparative genomics, just in summary, to ask what's functional, how things change over time. We spent the last 10 years doing a lot of this, a li little bit less in the, last, uh, in the last few years, mainly because we wanted to take advantage of the opportunities that the technology afforded in being able to uh, sequence lots and lots of humans and doing a lot of medical sequencing. But it's still important. Comparative genomics across organisms is still important. There's lots of questions that can be addressed. For example, what's the genomics basis in mosquitoes between disease vectors, those that vector disease and those that don't, um, in malaria, for example, and that's an active ongoing project. Another kind of comparative sequencing, for example, looking at a pathogen with, whose genome and hence its presentation to the human immune system varies quite a lot. Can you sequence thousands of isolates of a virus? find regions that are not changing in all those thousands and use that as a vaccine target. That's another, another kind of comparative approach. And many other questions. And I think I'll just uh, stop there. For those of you who hadn't uh, added these up, this is about, uh, about 70, uh, 70 metazoan sequences that are, that are done and about another 90 that are in progress, haven't quite started yet. And this is just NHGRI and a few others. There are another 100 on the docket for next year from BGI. And we'll have more as well, and so will others. And there's some that I that I can't even track. I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, next speaker is uh, Lise Feingold, uh, talking about more than the genes controlling the genome. So um, Adam really set this up uh, very well because I, uh, he mentioned I'm going to talk about more of the experimental um, efforts to uh, 
to identify functional elements in the human genome and try to begin to understand how gene regulation genes are regulated and so the big question we've been talking about is how do we read the human genome sequence there's no instruction manuals we really don't know we didn't initially know very much about the different punctuation marks and as Adam discussed evolutionary conservation can help us to identify functionally important regions about five percent of the human genome sequence is is highly conserved about one and a half percent in codes for genes and computational approaches can are moderately good at helping us identify where the coding sequences are but they're not very good at really understanding the fine gene structure what are the all the different alternative splice variants and all the different variants so this is really a big challenge even great challenges identifying the regulatory regions many of them are very very far away from genes and we don't even know which regulatory regions interact with with which genes and so we want to take an unbiased experimental approach to identify all the functional regions and Francis I think set this up earlier today to talking about one project in this direction is the encode project for encyclopedia of DNA DNA elements the goal of the project is to compile a comprehensive encyclopedia or catalog of all the sequence features in the human genome and in the genomes of selected model organisms much as we did with the human genome sequencing we started out with pilot project we focused on 1% of the human genome sequence which is about 30 megabases and this started back in 2003 and then in 2007 we expanded this to production effort across the whole human genome sequence also like what we did for sequencing we did we are studying some model organisms C. elegans and Drosophila we initiated these projects in 2007 and trying to identify all the functional elements in those genomes the advantages being that these are much smaller genomes they're less complex there's a lot of biology known about them and we can do genetic manipulation to really test our hypotheses for the function of the various various elements this past year with the economic stimulus our funding we initiated a small effort in mouse encode to we've limited production efforts to identify functional elements in the mouse really using that to see how that will help us in identifying functional elements in in the human genome and the last component is technology development we've had a number of efforts in that area and I'm sure we'll be doing that again in the future for not only identifying new functional elements but having better methods for for identifying functional elements that we already know about this is an old slide but it's a good diagram of the different functional elements that we're studying and the the middle gray area describes the technologies and I'll just say that most of those had been based in the pilot project with were array based and almost exclusively now these have been replaced with with sequencing to really give us very high accuracy and 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 very high resolution in identifying the functional elements do we say we don't have a pointer here thanks so great effort are it's under being done to do it find gene structures this is a lot of actually involving manual iteration we're looking at RNA transcripts both coding and non coding we're looking at cis regulatory elements such as promoters and transcription factor binding sites as well as long-range regulatory elements such as enhancers repressors and silencers insulators we're also looking using DNA suggestion to look at DNA hypersensitive sites and this is really what is it doing is identifying areas of open open chromatin presumably where where DNA binding put DNA binding proteins bind we're looking at epigenetic modifications such as DNA methylation and histone acetylation and I think we're going to hear more about that in the next session as well as some limited studies and looking at at DNA replication this is a slide from about a year ago just showing that there's lots of lots of data and lots of different data types this is a screenshot from the UCC browser where all of our our data is going up and if we included all the different data types it would go well down I don't know if we can go any further down in this building but it would go quite down maybe to the metro and really put up this slide to remind me to tell you that these projects are being done by large research consortia and they one of the great advantages of having these research consortia are that they are focused on many common cell types 
and using common data standards and formats is really facilitating the analysis of, of, um, of the data. So where are we now? Um, these, these projects are really in their large-scale data production um, efforts. The ENCODE and MONOCODE projects both have about 1,000 <laughs> data sets that have been submitted. Um, it's really been quite challenging to analyze the data. We've had to develop common data reporting formats, data standards, and analytical tools, that, um, especially when, the, when these um, production efforts started in 2007. It was really just when we were beginning to use these new uh, hyper-sequencing technologies, and a lot of the ana analytical tools had to be developed um, from scratch there. There are integrative analyses that are ongoing. We have long-term plans. Uh, Right now, they're ongoing for each individual organism. We have long-term plans to do integrative analysis across all of these um, genomes. I mentioned cross fly and worm, fly, worm, and human, and I forgot to add um, mouse to that. And um, we will be following up on uh, and expanding on some of the findings in the, in the pilot project, one being that the, the human genome is pervasively transcribed, and another being that, uh, as I think Adam mentioned, this many function elements um, seem to be unconstrained in, in evolution, and we want to uh, look beyond what just the conserved sequences are to identify functional elements. Um, so w where are we right now? Um, so in the, um, the pilot project, as I told you, we were focusing on 30 um, megabases, and about 5 percent of those sequences were constrained. The end of the pilot project was about three years ago. We had um, identified uh, assigned function to about 60 percent of the um, these um, the conserved sequences and about 40 percent remained uh, un and annotated. And now um, in the expansion to the, um, to the production phase, we've about uh, half the amount that's unannotated. It's about 20 percent of the sequences are un unannotated um, today. In part, that's because we've expanded the number of cell types that we're looking at. Francis mentioned, mentioned earlier, things are, uh, functional elements aren't functional in every single cell type, so you have to really ex uh, study a broad number of cells to, to be able to find uh, the different functional elements. And if you extrapolate this out now to the whole human genome, we're, we're focused here just on the ECODE regions, but uh, extrapolating out to the whole human genome, we've identified function to about 67 percent of the cons uh, conserved, uh, conserved sequences. So the question then is how will these catalogs of functional elements be used? They're going to greatly enhance our understanding of gene regulation, and this is really on a, on a spatial, temporal, and, and quantitative level. Uh, so we're not only interested in something that's on or off, but really how much is being expressed. Um, we want to know who all the different players are, how do they interact, where they're expressed, how do the variants uh, affect gene expression, and ultimately, really, can we predict gene expression from sequence? Can we figure out the, the grammar rules that we can look at a sequence and then, and then predict the sequence? And then ultimately, really, then how can we manipulate gene expression? We're also in, uh, going to use these catalogs to enhance our understanding of the genetic base basis of disease, and you're going to hear a little bit more about this in the next session, but many of the genome-wide association study hits um, find SNPs in non-coded regions, and so we want to know how these SNPs or, or disease mutations in non-coded regions alter gene expression and can contribute to disease. And it's also going to enhance our understanding of epigenetic contributions to disease. We're studying several epigenetic marks in ENCODE, and there's a, a sister uh, project, the Epigenomics, that formerly called Roadmap, now the NIH Common Fund that's really focused on identifying these um, epigenetic marks and with, with an emphasis focusing on, on how you can, can use them in, in disease studies. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm probably running out of time, so I'm gonna, <laughs> going to just run through this really quickly, just get an idea of where, where things are going in, in the future. There was two papers that were just published um, uh, in Science in, in April that uh, studied the variation of transcription factor, factor binding sites and in chromatin uh, structure in individuals. And so we're now, first we started with a catalog of just what are the functional elements, now we're applying this to understanding the variation uh, in individuals and how that, that can influence uh, changes in gene expression. And uh, then how also can you make links from GWAS hits to function and ultimately disease. And this is just referring to a paper that was published last year where um, they, they had, uh, this group had identified multiple regions in um, the uh, AQ24 region having alleles predispos predisposing to many different cancers, including prostate, breast, and colon. And the regions were really far from annotated genes. They were un uh, unknown biological function. And what this group did was, was to generate lots of different data types, very similar to the data types being generated by ENCODE, including RNA expression, histone modifications, 
binding sites for RNA polymerase and uh, the um, binding sites for androgen receptor. And they identified several of uh, enhancers, and they found a SNP in a single nucleotide polymerase in, in one enhancer that was where the, uh, a transcription factor bound, and they found that the, the prostate cancer risk allele um, was actually uh, facilitating stronger binding of that transcription factor and stronger androgen um, response. So uh, this is just really a glimpse at how these catalogs are going to be used and how they can, can be uh, applied to studying function and disease. Last member of this panel is uh, Jane Peterson, talking about basic research on the Genome, genome Human Microbiome Project and Knockout Mouse Project. All right, well, Larry asked me to cover uh, two projects, the uh, Knockout Mouse uh, Project and its um, extension, and then also the Human Microbiome Project. Francis um, did tell you a little bit about uh, the Knockout Mouse Project, which I'll refer to as COMP, um, so I can probably go through some of these slides relatively quickly. Um, the, I'm sure many of you have heard that and uh, reported on the fact that the mouse is a very important biomedical research model. It is really the only um, mammalian model for um, hum looking at human disease that is, has the, uh, m the good genetics that's been done on it and has all, the, all these features that have been developed in the, the last 50 years that, that make it a very tractable system for looking at human disease. It's, of course, not perfect, but it is the um, least expensive and the uh, most um, uh, functional mo model that we have right now. And importantly for this project in 2007, the Nobel Prize was given for this discovery um, where the introducing of specific gene modifications into ES cells um, was given. And of course, these ES cells can then be made into mice, and the mice can then be studied, allowing you to look at the function of that gene on what we call the phenotype. So Francis showed you this triangle, and this is the vision for the COMP project. Um, as you all know, we sequenced the mouse genome early in the human uh, genome project. Uh, the next step was then to develop ES cells, and this was COMP from 2006 to 2011. Um, so what we've been doing in that, that time period is knocking out or, or rendering null. That means that we insert something into each gene in the mouse genome and render it so that it doesn't work anymore, and then make these ES cells. Um, and as you can see, the goal over here was 17,000 genes would be knocked out. Um, Mark told you that there's 18,000 that are well annotated in human. In mouse, the number is less, and even 17,000 may be hard to get to. You can see that the progress here has been very good. We're, we're on track for um, making our goal. These are the U.S. participants, um, and these are the international participants in this project, and we expect to complete um, the U.S. part by the end of 2011 and the European parts um, a little bit later. So um, once we have all the genes knocked out, or even before we have all the genes knocked out, we can start working on making these, mi these ES cells into mice. Uh, we received a uh, supplement from the stimulus funds last year. And so I've already started making mice uh, from the ES cells. Um, and then following on from that, we want to start looking at um, how the gene expression in these mice are changed compared to a uh, normal wild-type mouse, and then start doing phenotyping. That is, start running these mice through batteries of tests that uh, look at hearing, for example, look at uh, neural responses. Um, measure their metabolism, um, and very often there is our um, autopsies done when the mice are killed. Um, so this is what we call COMP2, and that is a program that will be starting um, next year. Um, this gives you a little bit of an idea of the timeline. This is the um, knocking out the mice part of the timeline, knocking out the gene part of the timeline, the COMP1, 
And here's comp two. We've um, put together $22 million a year for the next five years in order to make the mice and to start running them through a battery of, of different phenotyping tests. The importance about this approach is that very often when investigators make a knockout mouse, it's because they're studying a particular gene. They expect it to be related to diabetes or to heart disease or something like that. So they really only put it through the phenotyping tests for uh, heart disease. This approach will, um, be, will not be uh, targeted like that. It will be more general. The, um, it'll be broad-based phenotyping where every knockout mouse that is made will go through a broad battery of tests. And it's already been shown that this very often uh, turns up phenotypes that are completely unrelated to what um, the phenotype you might expect. Okay, now we'll go on to the micro human microbiome project. Um, the human microbiome is um, very simply the bugs and the viruses, the bacteria, and um, the eukaryotic microbes that live in and on you. Uh, this is a relatively unexplored area of human health. We know that there are 10 times more um, bacteria um, or microbes that live on you than you, the number of cells that you have in your body. And yet it's uh, almost completely unexplored. So um, the microbiome project started about two years ago. The goal is to catalog the microbes that inhabit the human body, to examine whether changes in the microbiome can be related to health and disease, and then to create a community resource that will enable uh, this type of uh, approach of, of research to go forward in the future. It's a five-year five project, $157 million, and um, as Francis told you earlier, for all these large community resource projects, uh, we require uh, data and resource release, and um, that's what's happening in this project. And here are the URLs for the project. Now this is another timeline that shows you um, that this is a very diverse initiative. Um, we, the, the center's part of this initiative is looking at uh, two important questions. One is, what is the complexity of the human microbiome in different body sites? And we're looking at five different body sites and multiple sites within those. Um, that data is starting to come out now in the public domain. Uh, they are also looking to see if we have a core microbiome. That is, do humans share a certain number of, of microorganisms that, um, in common that define some basic need that we may have for microbiome uh, activity, or are we all unique? Then there's this demonstration project um, part of the initiative. These projects are designed to look to see if we can show correlation between changes in the microbiome and disease or health state. Um, there are 15 of these. I'll show you what the, they are in a minute. Um, and we are actually right here today. Uh, we're actually doing some of the review to decide how many of these 15 will actually ramp up um, to about seven or eight that will be larger scale projects looking at this. Um, this is really where I think you'll see a lot of interesting um, developments over the next couple of years in, as we find um, that there are correlations that can be found. Um, ca showing causation is something else. Um, there's always a question of does the disease come first and the inflammation caused by the disease affect the microbiome in that site? And trying to figure that out as to whether or not it's a change in the microbiome that causes the disease or vice versa is, is tricky. So um, I'll show you these in a minute. Uh, there's also computational tool development that's needed, technology development, uh, particularly to isolate some of the bacteria or, or microbes in general that uh, don't grow in labs and are very hard to get our hands on. Most of the uh, microbes in the human uh, body are not cultivable, so that makes it very hard to study them. The Data Analysis and Coordination Center, which handles the data, and then Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues Studies, because there are a number of, of issues that arise when you start talking about looking at people's human microbiome. These are the demonstration projects. You can see they are pretty broad range. There's psoriasis, there's the virome and febrile illness, um, obesity, acne, Crohn's disease, um, the ethereal microbiome in adolescent males, um, necrotizing endocarditis, 
enterocolitis, I always say it wrong. Uh, this is a um, disease of neonates that um, is deadly. Um, this is esophageal um, adenocarcinoma, vaginosis, another Crohn's disease, um, all sorts of colitis, abdominal pain and intestinal inflammation, um, atopic dermatitis and immunodeficiency, another vaginal one, and another Crohn's disease one. So most of them, half of them, are um, based in the gut. The rest are either skin, vagina, or looking at um, viruses. The core part of the, of the uh, project, which I told you about at first, is also looking at the oral cavity. And unfortunately, none of the demonstration projects looking at the oral cavity got funded. So this is our um, website. It's the hmpdacc.org. I invite you to go there to uh, get more information about it. And I'll stop there. Time for questions. Please come up to a microphone and ask any of these panelists any questions you might have. Uh-oh, everyone looks stunned. Here we go. Yes, uh, my name is Bob Cott. I'm a freelance writer. I've done work recently for NIDA and for uh, the DraftKings Symposia series on medical genetics. And my first question is to Dr. Geyer. Uh, you talked about, you basically listed roughly around 35,000 sequences which are somehow uh, gene or gene-like, the pseudogenomes and the, the uh, mRNA coding uh, sequences. But what percentage of the total genome is covered by those 35,000 coding things? And then I would also ask the different panel members to maybe say something about what they think the rest of that stuff is. It wasn't too long ago when the paradigm was that it was junk. And I kind of want to know what you think is out there. Thank you. Um, in in terms, is this on? <coughs> in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the amount of the genome that's covered by the coding el elements, it's about one and a half percent. And in terms of junk DNA, um, Sidney Brenner, a long time ago, um, uh, made the distinction between junk and garbage. <laughs> junk is what you keep in your attic because sometime you're going to want it. And uh, so I've always uh, looked at that, that, um, uh, that, that the concept of junk DNA with that in mind. But, but I think what you heard from Elise, and I'll let her uh, talk a little bit about it also, is that um, uh, it is clear that there is information, um, mostly doing much of which has to do with gene regulation and expression in the non-coding elements. How much of the rest of the genome uh, is, uh, incorporates that, we're not clear because we really don't understand very much of it mm -hmm. at this point. At least do you want to? I don't really have anything to add. I think that um, we, we do know that there are some functional elements that don't show very high levels of, of conservation. I think as we get more and more mammalian genomes sequenced, our, our notion of what's conserved is, is changing as well. So I think, I think we're really just beginning to learn, learn about that. I, I also want to add that beyond, uh, beyond the parts of the genome that control gene expression, which we've been talking about here as functional, there are other parts of the genome like uh, centromeres and telomeres that are important for uh, the chromosome mechanics, dividing the chromosomes up amongst prog progeny cells that are quite important. Um, but we have kind of a spotty understanding of some of those as well. Um, just to give you an example of what you have to wrap your mind around, um, human centromeres can vary from chromosome to chromosome quite a bit. And even on the same chromosome, depending on whether you got it from your mother or your father, they could be millions of base pairs different in size. But they're clearly functional. If you don't have one, you won't do very well um, uh, in a chromosome. But, but uh, the important thing seems to be a, a sort of general pattern of repeats rather than any particular length or any particular sequence. So what's functional about that? If you can get rid of, you know, if you can get rid of three or four million base pairs of a centromere and still function perfectly well, as long as you've got another million left, what's really functional? So you have to, there are subtleties here. 
Keep in mind, I mean, what, and Adam implied it, but just keep in mind, the focus of the discussion of what you heard from some of these speakers related to the function defined at the primary sequence level. But there is almost certain, and we, are, we will probably begin to understand it better in the future, a, another code of the genome that relates to three-dimensional structure. Uh, which might partially, it'll, be, it'll relate to the primary order of the letters, but there might be more than one way to get that structure um, by having different sequences might be able to adopt uh, the same three-dimensional structure. It's probably what's going on in the centromere, and there is some early evidence of, of elsewhere where it's going on where three-dimensional structure is playing a role, even though the two sequences might be very different. They might function in a similar way. So, so next Eric, question. Can I, yeah, can please. I add one thing? Um, very interestingly, though, I remember several years ago, uh, someone at LBNL um, deleted a megabase of uh, genome from a mouse and said they could not find any phenotype. Um, now, maybe the right phenotypic uh, screen hadn't been done. Nonetheless, um, there are parts of the genome that we're going to have a very hard time figuring out. And, and there are also big differences, or at least what maybe 10 years ago we would have thought as big differences even between individuals. There are, there are you know, probably tens of genes in some of you that, that, uh, that are functional that in me are not functional and vice versa. Um, there are, there are in the, Mark mentioned the Human Reference uh, Consortium, there are, there's a, 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 they were looking at, they try to represent genes that are functional. So they, they can represent lots of different things in the, in the reference, and you'd think you'd want to represent two things if you're going to represent anything in what you call a reference. One would be, if it's a gene, it should be the functional version of it, and the other is um, that it should be something that's around in a lot of the population. But it turns out that there are cases where most of us don't have a functional copy of the gene. Only a few percentage of the populations that have been looked at actually have a functional, functional copy. So there's weird stuff like that going on. Yes. <clears throat> Steve Sternberg, USA Today. Dr. Peterson, did I hear you say correctly that um, the oral microbiome isn't going to be funded? No. And what if I, that's what correct, I, what why? What I, I said was that there's not one in the demonstration projects. The, um, the more basic uh, large-scale project that's being done to look at how many microbes are there and if there's a core microbiome, the oral cavity is being well uh, sampled for that. And, it, and it's also true that the uh, Dental Institute is funding a number yeah. of uh, projects. Yes. It was only that in the one particular uh, call for projects, none of the ones that pro were proposing oral projects uh, were evaluated peer by peer review well enough to fund. Okay. We are going to move on. Let me thank these four panelists. And uh, we will uh, shift gears, and the second panel um, will uh, discuss genetic variation, why does it matter. Uh, we will have three speakers, um, the first uh, from NHGRI and then two outside speakers who came down from Johns Hopkins to join us. And the first speaker is uh, Lisa Brooks, um, and, uh, who will be talking about HapMap and the Thousand Genome Project. Thank you. Um, I oversee the program in genetic variation research at NHGRI. I also oversaw the HapMap, and along with Adam Felsenfeld and Jean McEwen, I'm overseeing the Thousand Genomes Project. So why do we care about genetic variation? 
Uh, there are several reasons. You know, we're here today because of the wonderful achievement of the human genome, but at any point in the human genome, it was just one person's sequence. Um, but genetic differences among people is what gives rise to differences that we all have and differences in risk of disease and differences in response to treatment. So that's something that NIH cares about a lot. Um, another reason is that genetic variation itself can be used to map the variants that affect disease gene, that, that affect disease. Um, and studying, finding the variants that actually causally contribute to disease lets us then study them to understand the mechanism of how they work, which means we can then try to intervene to prevent or to have treatments. So the types of variants, Francis has already discussed SNP. Here we have the same region of, of a part of a chromosome. So say it's like the left end of chromosome one. We have this one example of this chromosome from three different people. So this is basically, the, the, this is the same region in different people, three different people, one chromosome from each person. And so there are certain sites, the SNPs, which are the single base pair differences, single base pair spelling differences, where some individuals say have a C, other individuals have a T. Another SNP here. Uh, these are the most common types of variants among individuals. Uh, there's other types of variants, such as what we call them indels, insertions, deletions, where individuals, some, and Adam referred to this in some of the cases of people having like different, some different sets of genes, that there are, can be something as short as this, like one or two base pair insertions or deletions, up to much larger regions. Uh, there's also other types of variants uh, where pieces of chromosome are in different places in the genome, but they're not as common. So how much variation is there? Chromosomes from any two people differ about five in a thousand sites uh, when you look over a lot of the genome, including insertions, deletions. So we're about 99.5 percent the same. So uh, a thousand genomes data is just beginning to show. So these are very, very rough estimates. There's about more than 30 million variable sites in the DNA per population, and probably worldwide more than about 80 million. So what's a haplotype? Uh, so again, here's a part of a chromosome. The dots show the parts of the chromosome, uh, the sequence that's the same in all individuals, and so I'm just showing you the variation. And so here are six SNPs. So this particular chromosome has these particular SNP variants on it, and another chromosome has another set of SNP variants. So with six variants, six sites, and two possibilities at each site, that's two to the six, there's 64 possible chromosomes here. But in fact, in the genome, there's really only a handful at most places in the genome. So this, we're a young species, we haven't had enough time to have a lot of recombination mix things up. So this was really the basis for the HAP map, that basically there's regions of the genome where there historically has not been much recombination so that you have sets of variants that are highly associated with each other. What that means is if you're trying to figure out what the variants are in somebody, you don't need to know every single variant. Just knowing some variants, a handful in any particular region, will give you the information on just about all the variation in those regions. So those variants you can look at, we call tag SNPs. If you just look at this SNP and this SNP, say, you'll know the rest of the SNPs in that region. So this allows a lot of efficiency. So the major use of the HAP map then was to show the pattern of variation across the entire genome. And so here's examples in 10 regions. Uh, the red regions are places where you have bunches of SNPs that are highly associated with each other. So in a region like this, you don't need to choose many SNPs in order to really describe the variation in that region very well. So this sort of pattern that the HAP map shows, this is what's the basis for letting chip, you know, uh, microwave manufacturers go across the genome. In regions where there's where you, uh, the, these big red triangles, you don't need many SNPs, so you don't need to put many down. In regions that, are, that have much less of the red triangle, then you need to put a lot more SNPs down. So since genotyping is somewhat expensive, although it's of course getting cheaper, and sequencing is much more expensive, this was a way to make it much more efficient to scan across the genome, but to know that we're being comprehensive and yet cost efficient as possible. So 
the major, one of the major pr uh, products of the hat map then was this structure of pattern variation uh, to create chips, which then um, any disease researcher can use to study any disease they're interested in, in genome-wide association studies. That's G the GWAS, genome-wide association studies. So in these studies, they take people with a disease, people without a disease, apply these chips across the whole genome, and look for differences. And what these differences are are at these tag SNPs, and if you see a region of the genome where the frequencies of the tag SNPs are the same in people with a disease and without a disease, there's no evidence there's a genetic contribution to a disease in that region. On the other hand, if you find a region where the differences in frequency of these haplotypes, these are candidate regions for th where there's a variant that actually contributes to disease. So once uh, a GWAS study has been done, there'll be a set of regions that people want to follow up on to say, okay, this region likely contains a variant that contributes to this disease. So the question then is, what else is in that region? Because this is just a sampling of the variation in the region. It's, it describes the variation statistically, but you still want to know what all the variants are. So that was the basis for the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, which is basically looking for most variants in humans. Um, it's sequencing samples from 2,500 people, from 27 populations around the world, and it'll find almost all the variants in these samples that are frequency of 1% or higher. So this is a very large fraction of, of human variation. <coughs> okay. so, so this is how a GWAS study works in a very diagrammatic form. You find uh, regions that are associated with disease, as I showed you before. And so here's a region of the genome. Here's two genes, exons and introns. And here's hat map data. So it's fairly coarse across the region, but it's the red, the red boxes <coughs> show that these SNPs are highly associated with each other, and they're associated with the disease. So then the question is, What's all the variation in the region? So you can see these three variants, and here, <coughs> here are these variants again, but based on either sequencing in the GWAS study itself or using the thousand genomes data, which is much cheaper because you're not doing the sequencing. The data is already in databases. It's very quick. It's pretty comprehensive. Oh, thank you. And it's much finer resolution. So you can see just about all the variants in this region. <coughs> so then the question becomes, you've got a bunch of variants here. They're associated with each other. They're associated with the disease. Which variants are causal and which are just along for the ride? Once you've done this sort of study, that's about all you can go statistically in these studies. At this point, you have a set of variants. The, um, the way the genome is arc organized with these blocks of association means you, you can't go more than that based on this sort of study. What you really need to do then are functional studies. Um, Elise gave you some examples of those. Then you really have to look specifically at the variants themselves. It's a different type of biology. <coughs> Finding those variants is the easy part. <coughs> Figuring out what Excuse me. What they do is actually much harder because it becomes, when you do a genome-wide scan, you would have a chip, you do the sequencing, you just kind of do it. Here you actually have to do real biology on each, on each disease, on each set of variants. So you study the sets of variants experimentally to figure out which are the causal ones, and that's just one short phrase, but that's a huge amount of biology. A lot of biology goes into that. In order to understand their function and their interaction, genes with, them, with each other and genes with the environment. And once you, so there's sort of two types of things with genetic variation here. You're using genetic variation as a tool in order to understand the biology and the disease process. How does the disease process work by finding the variants that are involved in that? And then mechanistically, experimentally, how does it actually work? How does the variant and the particular variant give rise to risk for diabetes or Alzheimer's. So you're using variation to understand the biology, 
And of course, the other way of using genetic variation is for individuals. They have, we all have particular genetic variants that give us risk for various diseases, so we can use this information built on the other information about how things function uh, to try to aim to prevent, to diagnose, and to treat disease. So our next speaker, there's Aravinda. Next speaker is my good friend Aravinda Chakravarti, who came down from for the day from Johns Hopkins, and he will be speaking on findings from GWAS studies in dark matter: the missing heritability. There we go. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. I think uh, what I'm going to do is not show you slides and save myself. One minute. Um, Larry gave me, what, five, six minutes. He's going to wave when he thinks I've said enough. I thought what I was going to do for you is uh, give you a snapshot of not only how we got here, but uh, what we intend to do going forward with what we've learned over the last, in some sense, 10 years, but I'll focus largely on the last few years. Um, as a geneticist who's interested in studying human genes and how they impact on human disease, uh, this study has a very long history. We, in fact, the first time, uh, I don't even know that they were called human geneticists then, that anybody figured out that genes vary and their products vary and impact on physiology and phenotype was in the discovery of the most common blood group marker that all of you know, which is uh, the ABO blood group system. It was discovered in 1900 more than a century ago. And for a long period of time before the Human Genome Project, it's not like we didn't know of genes, we didn't know of variants, and we couldn't connect them with human disease, except that we had no algorithm, we had no crank, we had no specific organized way of finding more variants and connecting them to human phenotypes. In all of that period, what we learned is, yes, there are genes and there are mutations or variants within these genes that impact on a whole variety of human traits. In fact, that was the major reasoning for mapping and sequencing the human genome. But we knew that we missed a lot. The question is, beyond numbers, that is more variants, more diseases, and more phenotypes, what did we miss? The second thing I wanted to point out is that the role of genes, and by genes here I mean variation in gene, that is inter-individual variation, that is the fact that my sequence is different from, say, Eric Green's sequence or any of yours. The fact that this difference or these differences account for a significant portion, on average about 50% of any human phenotype you pick, could be height, could be propensity to uh, some neurological disease, could be some circulatory disorder, or even some rare disorder like cystic fibrosis, has been figured out for two kinds of evidence. We normally talk about twins, identical twins being much more similar than fraternal twins, but the crucial evidence for genes came from the fact by some kind of a titration effect. If you study my first degree relatives, such as my siblings, and then you go on to study say some second degree relative like my aunts and uncles, third degree relatives such as my cousins, you will find that the correlation between these relatives for anything you measure falls off by 50%. And this 50% fall off is in fact the hallmark of genes. We know of no other biological process that gives us that 50%. Many other things fall off, uh, but this has in fact been the persistence evidence for genes. So uh, this is not to say that the environment and other factors are not important, but they act in concert with genes to create who we are. The third thing I want to mention is this idea of doing genome-wide scanning. We've been doing this again for a while, but not with the efficiency with which we've done it since the human genome sequence came about. Most of you will remember, everybody argued for finding genetic markers and doing physical maps and genetic maps of the human genome long before we had the sequence, and the idea was to make a lot of advance in mapping the positions of genes that cause 
for the most part, rare disorders because you could collect families, trace them within families, and fewer markers did the job. This, of course, led to the cloning and identification of, I think the number is close to 4,000 entities. Um, and over this period, it's been, if you remember, the Human Genome Project, depending on dates that you pick, is, let's suppose we say 1988 or 1990, about 20 years, we do know the molecular basis of about 4,000 entities. They don't all map to 4,000 genes, a smaller number of genes, but we now know in reverse, if we started with a disorder or phenotype, what its basis would be. So I want you to remember that timeline. But when we tried the same methods on the major chronic diseases of mankind, the ones that affect the lives of most of us or our family members and friends, this process didn't work. And we had as geneticists a fairly good inkling as to why that would be the case but a hypothesis is never close enough to the kind of certainty or proof we would want. And with the human genome sequence, even the draft sequence, uh, there was talk and then there was discussion and inevitably among scientists there's some disagreement. But nevertheless, um, the community launched what's called the HapMap project. We also talked about it starting, sometimes the dates blur, but I think it's 2002, 2001, 2001 two. You're right, and um, the first fruits of the half map was finding the common kind of genetic markers no longer first attributed to function, but attributed to the nature of the variant and in fact its frequency, single nucleotide polymorphisms of which I think the half map has produced over four million. These are all common markers. And starting in about 2006 came the first results of using them using this information studies of human disease. And this use required the existence of large cohorts of patients. They had to be well phenotyped and looked at. But more important than that, it required a technology of what existed in databases to take it through these samples and families. And this is the era of the genome-wide association studies. In fact, by my counting, it's only about begun. And we have, I think, in the literature, something close to a thousand sites in the genome that are involved in various disorders, for example, like type 2 diabetes and atherosclerosis, as well as many, many other medically important traits, as well as traits that are teaching us a lot about genetics, such as height. Now, most of the markers that we had in HapMap, and you've heard this, were not causal by themselves. And the reason is the 4 million is only a small, really a very small amount of the total amount of variation that exists in humans. We've turned out to be, we are less variable than, for example, many of our uh, cousin species, if you will, which is the great apes, but nevertheless, we are much more variable than we ever thought. So in using this in the GWAS studies, what is it that we learn? I'm going to start with the positive first. We learn a huge amount of new biology, a biology that we haven't even scratched the surface of. We've clearly learned, for example, the ones that you've heard of, the importance of the complement pathway in age-related macular degeneration. We've learned quite convincingly that the fundamental problem in type 2 diabetes is not insulin resistance, but rather insulin secretion. The resistance does come about later. And in many of the studies that we've done, for example, in blood pressure and uh, as a trait and then hypertension, as well as something that's been fascinating us over the last few years, something that we never understood, this entity called sudden cardiac death, we now have in each of these traits at least 30 targets in which there are compelling genes that we need to study. The most common drugs for hypertension, for example, are drugs that modulate what's called the renin angiotensin pathway, and it's come as quite a surprise. Not any of the common variants that we know to date map to that locus. So this is not to say that that information is not helpful, but that there's much, much more to learn. Sudden death was a sort of quite an interesting example. I'll just take another minute or so, but that as we've had advances in medical knowledge and public health, 
clearly the mortality from heart disease has reduced. It's reduced remarkably over the last 25 years. Not the entire morbidity, but clearly the mortality has decreased. What's happened then is something else has come to prominence, and this something else is sudden cardiac death, of which arrhythmias are thought to be the major cause so far, but there must be other sort of factors that lead to somebody who has none of the known cardiovascular risk factors that we know of to suddenly, meaning within 24 hours, just literally drops dead. The many athletes, in which case, that have succumbed to sudden death, in which case we know of some rare syndromes that have predisposed them or some other physiological stress. But these are athletes. They've stressed themselves many, 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 many times. And the question is why then is one of the factors we don't understand. So sudden death, I would say that before the era of genome-wide association studies was only understood in a handful of rare Mendelian syndromic cases. And starting in 2006 till today, many laboratories, including ours, have not only identified the first major gene, major meaning having a significant impact, uh, through the ECGs, through the QT interval in the ECG. Um, not only has this um, showed us a factor that affects the ECG and puts at least some part of the QT interval in the risk zone, but we've shown that it affects sudden cardiac death in a major way. And we've gone all the way to now have a mouse model. Now, in four years, that might seem to some of you to be a very long time, but it's a very, very short period in which we've moved from almost total ignorance to understanding at least a big fraction. Now, a big fraction doesn't mean 100%. We explained with the about 30 of these loci, something like 20% of the genetic variation, we've got a long way to go. And the reason why we think that we have a long way to go, this whole idea of this missing heritability, is that as one uncovers one genetic hypothesis, as scientists, we always study hypotheses in a very specific way, one at a time. These are observational studies. These are not studies in experimental systems. We come as we come. We volunteer for studies the way we do. And so the first hypothesis that was possible to study with the knowledge and the technology that we had are these common variants. But it is entirely true that they haven't explained the whole picture, and I don't think it was a fair even expectation that it should have. But the misinheritability is a problem. But that doesn't mean that that problem doesn't have many adequate competing hypotheses. And I will tell you at least my bias, and I'm sure that Andy, Feinberg, Andy Feinberg is going to tell you of his bias. Well, they're not biases. They are hypotheses. We need to test them. And each is going to uncover further details that we don't know of. The Thousand Genomes Project, which is in full swing now, again, I forget. I think the first discussions in Cambridge were about three years ago, something like that. 2007. Was, in fact, launched with the idea that we need to not only go wider, meaning study a much more extensive group of humans from more populations and more individuals per population, but also look deeper into genetic variation, not only common ones, but even uncommon ones. Um, Lisa gave you a figure of about 30 million that we expect um, per population. Uh, Europeans that are somewhat less variable than other human populations our estimate, we can quibble a little bit, is of the order of 20 million or so, of which about 4 million or rather 5 million are above the frequency of 10 percent. They are within reach today. About another 5 million between 1 to 10 percent. They're almost within reach. That is, they will be in the next six months. But there's a substantial number that is far less, and this is where sequencing and other technologies will come into being. But the point that I want to leave you with is that the hidden heritability problem is partly explained by much of genetic variation that we're only uncovering today. And sometimes I know we get into esoteric debates about what's rare or what's common, but in fact almost all of the studies are in the direction of finding a much bigger share of the genetic variation 
uh, that exist in human populations and in developing technologies and methods for studying them in fairly large groups of well phenotyped individuals. So I'll quit there. And our last speaker for this panel is also from Johns Hopkins, Andy Feinberg, who will be uh, talking about epigenetics. Well, um, I was trying to think about how to um, explain epigenetics in five to seven minutes. So I thought, well, I'll do some this like pompous thing called a Gedanken experiment, which is, it's like an old fashioned word. It means thought experiment to explain epigenetics. And this is, there are much better ones than mine, like Schrodinger's cat, which is alive and dead at the same time because you can't exactly predict when radioactive decay takes place. Um, and Maxwell's demon, which is a famous thing about this little monster who opens the little door and the particle could go in or out to explain uh, thermodynamics. Okay, so I'm going to give you my Gedanken experiment. And can I just say, please, it's, it's meant to be lighthearted. Do not take this on face value, okay? <laughs> please, all right? All right. <laughs> um, so what makes us different? Okay, this is the great question. That's what Lisa raised, uh, and, 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 and I think it was Arab Vinden maybe who was making the point about, like, do we even call ourselves human geneticists, you know, um, decades ago? That's what we really want to know, what's responsible for phenotypic variation. Okay, so here's my example. The United States Congress. You were in Washington there down the street. So what makes them different? Every time I open up the, the paper, I never read about how they're the same. I always read about, you know, these want this thing and they want that thing and, you know, they don't agree on this and that and there's the House and the Senate and they don't agree either. And so how do you explain that from a genetic point of view? Well, each one of them, the 535 people, has 3 billion base pairs of DNA and there are about 3 million differences in DNA sequence. So, I mean, I guess that's one explanation that might explain the differences. That's about a tenth of a percent. All right, but what about this, a human and a chimpanzee? What makes them different? I mean, there's, although those two particularly don't really look that different than that particular picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the Washington Zoo, you're not going to see a conference like this, you know, if you go to the uh, primate house. And, um, and there's 3 billion base pairs of DNA in them also, but there are about 30 million differences in DNA sequence. And although the thing about the Congress was sort of, you know, a joke kind of, but the, this is serious. I mean, the, 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 that's the reason somewhere in those 30 million explains those huge differences between them and us. So um, now, what if you were to do the following thing? If you were to take the person sitting next to you and autopsy them, which I wouldn't recommend, but <laughs> if you did, you would see all those different um, organs, uh, and they look very different from each other, the brain, the liver, the eye, the, the uh, heart, the lungs, the colon, and uh, the pancreas, and all that. They're very different, and I would argue that tissue development, which is what this is, is far more different than the differences among the Congress members or the differences between the human and the chimpanzee. And uh, they're just profoundly different, one tissue from another. So how do we explain that? Well. There's three billion base pairs of DNA also, and there are zero differences in DNA sequence that determine this as far as we know. Um, the, you know, the jury's still a little bit out on that, but it doesn't seem so. And the things that we do know about, like telomerase uh, length changes and immunoglobulin gene rearrange rearrangement, actually aren't, uh, the, they're, they're important, but they're not necessarily what's causing these changes. So we don't think that there's anything at the level of sequence that's responsible. And so that's what epigenetics is about. It's information that a cell remembers, like the liver knows it's a liver, other than the DNA sequence, and it controls tissue-specific developmental programs. And I think that's a fundamentally important thing. And, you know, a lot of what we do goes back to the early days of Darwinism uh, and Mendelism. And um, Darwin in particular, I've gone back and read Origin of Species a couple times for another reason over the last year, and he actually at the end talks about how he wished he understood developmental biology because he thinks there's something very important about heredity and developmental biology, but since we don't know what that is, he can't address it, and he feels like very frustrated. I get the feeling reading it that he wishes he could live another 50 years because he doesn't want to let that go. So what are examples of epigenetic change? So besides the, the DNA sequence that you, you know, that you know about, the A, G, T, and C, there's this extremely beautifully drawn here, carbon with three hydrogens. Um, that's called DNA methylation, and you hear a lot about that. We work a lot, about, a lot on that. 
um, and it's a chemical change in DNA, and there's a mechanism for remembering what those changes are when a cell uh, divides. Now, so I'm very interested personally in disease-related variation, and many common diseases seem to involve developmental defects in the same organs I told you about, like cancer involves developmental changes in the stomach, for example, stomach cancer, where the cells aren't uh, differentiating normally. Uh, there are studies on schizophrenia in the brain suggesting that there might be developmental differences, either by imaging or in terms of developmental pathways for some of the genes that have been found, uh, kidney disease uh, related to diabetes, uh, diabetes generally appears to involve uh, metabolic developmental changes, a number of, of organ systems you can make a developmental argument about. And you have to also add to this the role of the environment. So let's say you have the perfect genome and you get the perfect man, uh, here David, um, uh, and uh, you know, the Michelangelo statue. And then you give him like a Dubber Super Whopper Burger or something, <laughs> and you get this. And <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, there are problems, uh, developmental problems that occur based upon our environment that um, would not necessarily be affecting the genome, but we know that diet and other environmental exposures can affect your epigenome. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly, um, our lab, as well as many other labs, um, are now very interested in pursuing this. We're, we've been using a technique. Uh, we're starting to use sequencing for this, but um, you know, you heard about the cost. So if we want to look at thousands of samples, we're still using uh, uh, methods that are cheaper at the moment, involving arrays. Uh, to look at about a, slightly under a half of all the sites that can get methylated across the genome. And just a couple of the things that we've observed, and I apologize, it's a data slide, um, but this is like, um, like a measure of DNA methylation on this axis, and here's just a region of the genome, about 2,000 building blocks of DNA here. And this is just a study that we published last year that shows a very strange thing, that there's an area where if you did that autopsy, and we did actually um, on people who'd given permission before they died, you know, to be studied in that way, um, uh, and looked at uh, uh, and found a lot of regions, many thousands of them, where there's more methylation in some tissues and less methylation in another, in other ones, uh, or vice versa. But, um, but when we look at a cancer, in particular colon cancer, what's happening is that the pattern of DNA methylation is changing and it's resembling the wrong tissue. And that, in general, we're finding that many cancers have a methylation change that's um, actually a combination of their normal methylation pattern, but also the methylation patterns that are developmentally wrong, that involve other tissues, that would fit that picture that I was telling you a little bit ago about how um, disease may be related to developmental defects. So in a way, cancers are thinking they're the wrong uh, tissue, and that would be an epigenetic change related to development and related to disease. And then this is just some unpublished data that we're hoping to get out soon. But here's another one of those little pictures where there's more methylation and there's low methylation on a group of individuals that were followed from a cohort in collaboration with Dr. Goodnison at the Icelandic Heart Foundation and with Danny Fallon, who's an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins. And uh, what we're seeing is there, there are regions where there's a great deal of variation in the normal population, but they seem to segregate out normal from obese individuals. So it may be that Michelangelo uh, statue uh, problem may be manifested to some degree in epigenetic differences, and they may be a little bit greater um, as people are older in the same individual. And the gene I'm showing in particular here happens to be a gene for development. So this is very new. It's not even published yet, but we're hoping that sort of thing um, can lead to uh, new insights. And there, as I say, there are many laboratories. It's always easier to talk about your own, but I mean, I, I, I mean, for, for example, there's an epigenetic roadmap initiative you can see on the NIH website, and there must be 50 labs that are doing experiments like this um, uh, with NIH support at least. So um, uh, uh, that's about it. Thanks. Okay. So this panel is now open for questions. Well, that is one short microphone, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. We can, we can fix that. There you go. Well, thank you so much for your excellent presentations. I'm Catherine Talmadge uh, with uh, the American Dietetic Association and Personalized Nutrition. Uh, where does you must have liked that hamburger uh, analogy, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I've, uh, the, uh, the whole idea of how genes respond to the environment and to diet and to exercise is fascinating to me. 
I wrote a major piece in the Washington Post a few years ago about how exercise turns on certain genes, which when they're turned on, clear fat and sugar from the bloodstream quickly and efficiently, but you have to, have to exercise every 24 hours for it to work. <laughs> the GLUT4 and the LTL genes. Anyway, so the latest thing, you know, the hottest thing in nutrition these days is vitamin D. And I understand that vitamin D is needed in order to help DNA um, work in absolutely every cell. Um, can you explain that and if that, and, and for instance, I apparently DNA is necessary for the renin, the hyper, it affects hypertension because it affects the renin hormone, it affects um, insulin, it affects uh, so many of our, every cell in our body apparently, um, and the DNA in each cell and how it works. Who wants to take that I, one? Um, let, me, let me try. I don't know anything specifically about vitamin D and the effects that you're talking about, and, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's not correct. I mean, science is so broad, it's, it's difficult to keep up even with one's narrow field. But I think the question that you're, gonna, that you're bringing up is, in fact, one area that's increasingly getting attention, which is, um, you know, for a long period of time, we've gone through this um, not very useful debate in talking about nature versus nurture. So much more interesting and sort of, sort of tautologically has to be the case that how is it that our genes, more importantly, how is it that our physiology, uh, for example, your first example, respond to environmental factors. And we're now all using the word environment in a very, 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 very different way, um, in a very broad way. So it's um, no doubt the case that it's not only exercise. Uh, by the way, exercise has been shown in a variety of studies to uh, affect many aspects of uh, insulin re regulation, for example. Uh, but there must be many other environmental factors, diet being one of them. I'm sure temperature and uh, other aspects of local environment are important. Uh, that uh, many such things not only have an immediate proximal effect, such as what you're talking about, but many are known to have very long-term effects. There have been some beginning studies done on uh, the survivors of the famine in Holland, for example, in World War II, that shows that at least for some genetic markers that there have been imprints left, uh, I think in this case in their offspring, so which is you know many, many decades ago. So there's no doubt that uh, these exist. And it's only recently we now have the tools to go and look at various kinds of protein markers, metabolomic markers, and other markers together with a DNA sequence to sort of figure out what the interplay uh, between so-called environmental factors are with genes. I don't know whether that answers your specific question. I can't tell you anything about how vitamin D affects replication. I think that's what you said. Other questions? So my name is Larry Thompson. I'm the communications director at Genome. So we've been following uh, the, the variation studies for some time, and there has been this debate about dark matter and all that, and Aravinda talked very eloquently about going down into the deeper into the sequence and looking more at the sequence that's uh, the sequence variance that there is. And Andy was talking about very much the kind of uh, modifications on top of the sequence. I was wondering if the panel as a group could give us a sense of um, and, and the idea of all this, of course, has been that you could sum up all these different changes, and out of that summing up of the variants and the control changes, you would get the phenotype. And I, I, and I think probably naively, at least on my case, I thought, you know, it's going to be 30 maybe or 40 different things across the genome that then led to diabetes or heart disease or whatever. Uh, now that we're getting further and further into these studies and we're seeing that it's, uh, it's complicated, I guess we should have expected that. I was wondering if you can give me what your sense is of how much variation or how, how, much, how many changes will have to be 
observe to be able to sum up to have a statistical prediction of what your risks really are for whatever kind of disease you're particularly working on? I, I think we all could probably talk for quite a while about this. In fact, we did <laughs> earlier last spring. But, um, you know, there's going to be probably many things. Uh, the one thing I think is that scientists don't have a crystal ball, and I think that the good ones have a sense of humility about their own work and also about what their guessing power is. I mean, there are a number of things that probably contribute to uh, the perceived gap between uh, what, what we measure as heritable risk, like our Vinod was talking about, and then when we look for variants and try and see if we can add them up and account for disease. And there are a number of things. I mean, we're going to need to get sequencing at a more um, higher resolution to find tiny changes, look for rare variants. Um, there's a very promising area that has to do with um, copy number variation. Uh, there's another idea that I think may be part of the story, I don't know to what degree, that, um, uh, that we published earlier this year that suggests that there might be heritable variants, V-A-R-I-A-N-T-S, in your DNA that contribute to phenotypic variants, V-A-R-I-A-N-C-E, in a stochastic way. That, that was published in PNAS in January, and we're pursuing that pretty aggressively to look at some of these populations so that there might be some degree of of um, stochasticism in phenotype, but that might be itself, that degree of stochasticism might be controlled uh, genetically. But we all have our sort of pet theories about this, and uh, I think um, everything is going to contribute to some degree. Uh, we just don't know which ones to how much. So I, I, I think it's important to distinguish uh, sort of two parts to uh, the question that you asked. One is, it is entirely possible and feasible and probably likely that there are hundreds of genes that have genetic variants that affect a particular phenotype. Uh, I think the current estimate of the number of genes that control height is probably several hundred. Um, that's, um, that's fine, and I think, uh, I think you use the word it's complex. Well, everything in biology may be complex. Um, I think Physics is entirely, you know, very complex, but there are many aspects of physics that are well described and theoretically explainable. So I think we are at this stage when we often use the word complex, we mean that the physiology is complicated and the genetics is complicated, but honestly, we are much more ignorant than the stuff is complex yet. So I have no doubt, even if there are 300 things, if we understood it much better, and I think a much better position to understand. Uh, we will have a much more satisfying view of what's going on. The other part to remember is, you know, there could be hundreds, but despite there being hundreds of things, there may be tens of things that are rate-limiting, that are manipulable, manipulable experimentally as well as therapeutically. Just because there are 300 sites of variation in me that distinguish me from somebody else as to the risk of hypertension doesn't imply that there are 300 sites at which, you know, my physiology needs to be tweaked for my blood pressure to be normal. We know that's not the case because about a third of people do very well, exceedingly well on relatively a single blood pressure medication. And the reason why that's important is if you look at even molecular biology, replicating DNA is extremely complicated. But scientists have recapitulated replication in a test tube now for at least, I don't know how many decades, three, right? If we couldn't do it, we couldn't figure out that it sometimes happens in reverse. So I think we will understand enough, I'm quite confident, and we already know enough that we need to get to the genes, we need to understand all these other mechanisms that's coming up, like from the comparative studies as well as the epigenetic studies that we will be able to manipulate and understand things first experimentally and then physiologically. Uh, I, I, the 300 need not deter us or scare us. And uh, I, I, I think the idea is to understand more. And I think we are, my fear is we are finding more things than our capacity to understand them in the same pace. A Andy, how certain are we, we that we know all the different chemical modifications of DNA or even all the, I mean, all the decorations, sometimes not even going to be a modification. I mean, epigenetics, we sort of focus on uh, just a small number of things. Do we have any idea that uh, what the full universe of DNA decorations might be in the epigenetic world? 
that's a great question, and the answer is we don't. And um, in fact, the number of modifications of DNA so outpaces our understanding of the mechanism for replicating those changes. Right. So at the moment, the only mechanism that we know for really well for copying information, non-sequence information, is DNA methylation. There's an enzyme. We understand that extremely well. We've known it for 25 years. Um, that, not, that's not to say that these, that these histone modifications, chemical modifications, clearly are heritable during cell division, and there's some very promising models for how that's done. And it's true. It's just that um, the, the basic biochemistry has not been worked out. It's hard to believe that the more than 110 now known uh, modifications of histones um, are all independently replicated during cell division. Some of them must be dependent on other ones. So I think the really key thing is to figure out mechanisms of copying the information and then focus on those because they're going to be primary. But there might be many more out there we haven't that's even discovered right. yet. That's right, and that's right. And the role of RNA in all this is also something that people are just beginning to understand. Too. So, so by the time we get our head around sequence variation, we will recognize that's going to be trivial compared to the other variation that's probably out there. Or perhaps. Well, in a way, although I can just say, as an epigeneticist, we've profited so much from what's happened in terms of genome sequence. Of I mean, course. it seems that so much of what we do in methylation and chromatin is driven by DNA sequence that as we learn more, those other things will be But that's the too. technology that drives the discovery. It doesn't mean you completely understand the choreography of that's it. That's correct. Right. Lisa, right. did you want to add something? Yes, I wanted to add to what Larry was asking, uh, making a very important point that you asked about integration. So when we find out that there's 20 to 200 or 300 variants affecting something like type 2 diabetes, it's not that they're all going to act one at a time and you can just add them up. We're going to need to know how they all interact with each other and how they interact with the environment. So, so if you're doing something like 23andMe or something, you don't want to know one at a time. You want to know what is my risk. It's going to be higher. It's going to be lower. It's going to be based on the information all the set of variants plus some environmental contributions. Um, but that, but I do have, to getting to this question of what's missing in terms of explaining the genetic contributions to disease, I actually have a very simple answer. Um, it may be expensive, but it doesn't mean it's not simple, is large sample sizes get you a lot of information because large sample sizes, if you're looking at these study, disease studies, um, by having a lot of people look at, you can find a lot of rare variants. So there's a lot of people who say it's rare variants. Uh, the other thing by having large sample sizes is that you'll be able to detect small effects. So certainly some of these contributions are going to be from perfectly common variants that don't have large effects, they have small effects. And if you have a large sample size, you'll be able to detect small effects. And the other thing, if you have a large sample size, you'll be able to detect interactions of genes with each other and with environmental factors. So um, Eric, as, as, you know, as a funding agency here, this is something that's actually very important. By having very large sample sizes in these studies, you'll be able to detect a lot of you know, this, quote, missing heritability. Though there's sort of a lot of possible explanations that will be helped by that. And, and just one other point related to this. I, I, I mean, I think this is a really, uh, a really good point, but Ar Arvind and I have had this discussion, discussion before that, that a, a really terrific model system to study human disease is, is human beings. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we've been around for a long time for so many generations, with, and we don't get to control the patterns of mating and all the rest of that, but it's ver I think it's very well worth our exploring in great detail um, the, the nature of uh, phenotypic heterogeneity in, in large uh, sample populations and how that might be related to exposures and so forth. I think we need to do it to get the answers. I agree with you. Okay, I want to thank these three panelists for their contribution. <laughs> we, we, we have, we're precisely 34 minutes behind, um, but we're going to try to make some of this up. We're going to take a 10-minute break now. We're not inhumane, so we will take a break. Uh, but we will try to reconvene here.